Chapter 239 BB 1 Hey, something's wrong. I heard Cecile's voice from behind me. Oh, this is bad. Let's hurry. I responded without turning around to look at Cecile, who had shouted. The beast men are really fast. A bright red beetle-like magical beast was chasing the adventurers around. The party of adventurers seemed to consist of beast men. It didn't matter if they were the vanguard or the rear guard or in formation, they ran away as if they were desperately trying to save their own lives. Their speed appeared to surpass that of humans. That unfamiliar magical beast is such a formidable foe. Some of the adventurers seemed to have adamantite greatsword. They didn't look like a party of weak adventurers with inexpensive equipment. Some of them were carrying shiny black adamantite great swords. Ah! One of the fleeing cat beast men stumbled and fell heavily. Sarah! The red beetle-like magical beast changed its target to that cat beast man with an eerie mewling sound. It had large red beetle-like horns on its forehead and large stag beetle-like jaws, showing jagged teeth and a long, wagging tongue. Sarah! Arg! No! Run! A wolf beast man immediately noticed that the cat beast man had fallen. He hesitated for a moment, but returned to help. However, the red beetle-like magical beast was closer to the cat beast man, so it was very unlikely he would make it in time. Karina, Dogora, you take the front. Yes. Oh. Hey. Who are you? Then my friends and I arrived. B-rank birds were using their awakening skill, soar. Ignoring the reaction of the startled wolf beast man called U.R., Karina and Degora's great sword and axe slammed into the face of the red beetle-like magical beast with tremendous force. Gaiaf! There seemed to be a lot of momentum generated by the B-rank bird, soar, as Karina and Degora's attack was more powerful than what I had anticipated. Oh, this is bad. Let's hurry! I responded without turning around to look at Cecile, who had shouted. The beast men are really fast. A bright red beetle-like magical beast was chasing the adventurers around. The party of adventurers seemed to consist of beast men. It didn't matter if they were the vanguard or the rear guard or in formation, they ran away as if they were desperately trying to save their own lives. Their speed appeared to surpass that of humans. That unfamiliar magical beast is such a formidable foe. Some of the adventurers seemed to have adamantite greatsword. They didn't look like a party of weak adventurers with inexpensive equipment. Some of them were carrying shiny black adamantite greatswords. Ah! One of the fleeing cat beast men stumbled and fell heavily. Sarah! The red beetle-like magical beast changed its target to that cat beast man with an eerie mewling sound. It had large red beetle-like horns on its forehead and large stag beetle-like jaws, showing jagged teeth and a long, wagging tongue. Sarah! Arg! No! Run! A wolf beast man immediately noticed that the cat beast man had fallen. He hesitated for a moment, but returned to help. However, the red beetle-like magical beast was closer to the cat beast man, so it was very unlikely he would make it in time. Karina, Dogora, you take the front. Yes. Oh. Hey. Who are you? Then my friends and I arrived. B-rank birds were using their awakening skill, soar. Ignoring the reaction of the startled wolf beast man called U.R., Karina and Degora's great sword and axe slammed into the face of the red beetle-like magical beast with tremendous force. Gaiaf! There seemed to be a lot of momentum generated by the B-rank bird, Soar, as Karina and Degora's attack was more powerful than what I had anticipated. The magical beast made a sickening squeal, then a high-pitched metallic clang sound came from where it struck the weapons. The red beetle-like magical beast backed up, bouncing once or twice on the ground. However, when I thought that it would continue to bounce, it regained its position while hovering in the air. Alan, it's very hard. 
Oh, we didn't even leave a scrap chapter, what the hell is this guy? Doesn't look like the damage went through. We had made a perfect surprise attack, but the magical beast was only blown away and didn't receive any damage at all. Hey, what the hell is wrong with you people? We am here to help you because you've been attacked. We will handle the situation here, so please run away. It's a lie. I stopped by to beat the floor boss. Please run away because if you fight as well, we will be forced to share. What? Don't you know, he's BB. BB? Is it a famous magical beast? It's a blood blast beetle, an S rank magical beast, and you started to fight it without even knowing that? I asked him what BB was, and he told me. BB was a S rank floor boss. I guess it's an S rank magical beast, but that BB or whatever it's called hasn't attacked us while floating. Does that mean it's watching us now that something strange has arrived? There were also S rank magical beasts on the second floor. There were several floor bosses in each floor of the S-Class dungeon, but we were told that there would always be at least one S-Rank Magical Beast on each floor. I understood that the S-Rank Magical Beast in the second floor was nicknamed BB. BB was chasing the beast men around, but when my friends and I arrived, he changed the point where his compound eyes were staring at us, as if he was trying to determine who we were. I'm sorry, but I need to concentrate on the fight. If possible, I would appreciate it if you could withdraw. I determined BB to be an enemy that required our full concentration. Yes, I understand. I'll thank you guys when we both get out of here alive. It helps. I'll be sure to charge you. I interjected him when he said that he would thank us later, thinking a business deal would be better than making someone owe a debt. I'll be sure to thank you. Hey, you guys, we're retreating. The remaining beast man and the cat beast man called Sarah, who seemed to have been a healer and healed her own wounded leg, began to retreat. You are, let's go. Oh. You, what's your name? You are asked for my name while being urged by Sarah to escape. Alan. Then, Alan, maybe this will help you. Magic doesn't work on BB. With that said, the beast men began to flee as fast as they could. Haha, <laughs> that was valuable information. Magic doesn't work on BB, so I guess the only way of damaging it is by using physical attacks, but its long horns and jaws are dangerous. Poisonous needles or anything like that won't work as well. Dogora, Karina. Its big jaws are dangerous. So, keep your distance and attack. Got it. I wanted to analyze our enemy to make a strategy to defeat it without any risk. Karina and Dogora kept their distance and attacked Bibi, while Bibi also attacked the two in close quarters. Both Karina and Dogora's weapons were quite large, allowing them to keep their distance from the enemy. Both Karina and Dogora were fighting with caution against Bibi's large jaws and long horns. Cecile Hit it with some fire magic. What? But that guy said magic doesn't work. Cecile said that my instructions didn't make any sense. That's just what he said. We have to try it ourselves first. I didn't trust the beast man you are's advice, so I wanted to verify it. I get it. With that said, Cecile activated her fire magic and a large fireball struck BB. Hum, mm, except for Merle, all of my friends' skills are below skill level 6, but they all seem stronger than when we fought against Demon General Razel. Thanks to the fight against the White Dragon, my friends who had had their talents changed had risen considerably in their level. The passive status increase skill in normal mode could be unlocked at skill level 3 and 6, but my friends had only unlocked their first skill level 3 1 passive skill then. But even so, they were all stronger, albeit only slightly, than when they had fought against the demon General Razel. This S-rank magical beast called BB was about the same size as B-rank bird but not that huge. A fireball struck it without regard to where Karina and Dogora were fighting. But just in time, Karina and Dogora moved to the side to escape the fireball. 
Bibi, who had been fighting against Karina and Dagora just before, was completely engulfed by the fireball at the perfect moment. I was using sharing on all the B-rank birds who were part of the fight. I had complete control over their movement and vision, so I could do such things without having to give instructions to Karina or Dagora. Cashew Cashew However, Bibi, who has not been burned at all, emerged from the flames as if shaking off the flames with his wings. It didn't seem to have been damaged at all. Hum, insect-type magical beasts are supposed to be weak against fire magic. Its magic resistance is too high. Then, if not magic, I guess I can go for it. I determined that the information the wolf beast man, you are provided to be true, as I consider our next plan. Karina. Dogora. Find the right time to use your extra skills. Yes. Oh. Fire magic didn't work, so I made my next move. Sophie, use Spirit King's Blessing. For Mar, find an opening and crush even one of its compound eyes with your extra skill. Yes, Master Allen. Okay. Cecile, use a barrage of fire magic to keep Bibi from moving. Okay. It was a strategy we had been using ever since we were at the academy. We had gotten a lot better over the course of the Rosenheim War at using it. Sophie used all of her mana and asked the spirit god Rosen on her shoulder to use the spirit king's blessing. The spirit god did a hip-swinging dance and a glowing, bubbly rain fell. And everyone's status was increased by 30%. With the timing of Bibi's momentary retreat, I summoned several earring stones and had them use their awakening skill, self-destruct. BB was engulfed in flames and smoke with the sound of explosions. Now is the time. Come on out, Dora Dora. Commander Birank Dragon appeared before BB's eyes, who had retreated because of the explosions caused by earring stones. Then, immediately after being summoned, Commander Birank Dragon used its awakening skill, Fires of Wrath. BB was completely engulfed in flames. Gahu. However, the commander Birank Dragon turned into a glowing bubble as it was poked by the horn on Bibi's forehead, which emerged from the flames with great force. How about this? Just as the Birank Dragon disappeared, Cecile hit Bibi with a huge block of ice, which she had created using ice magic. Cecile's ice magic blew it away, but Bibi remained undamaged. It bounced a few times, but then balanced and hovered in the air. M. Han. Formal used his extra skill, Arrow of Light, to destroy one of Bibi's compound eyes, but it was repelled. Bibi's eye was perfectly fine. Gisha. Bibi continued to emit eerie squeals, showing its fangs and tongue from its mouth, which could be seen through its jaw. Then, from the point where it was blown away, it closed the distance at once. How about this? At that moment, I summoned a B-rank stone in Bibi's path with, fast summon, causing a large, round shield to be thrust out in front of it. Bibi suddenly slammed into the B-rank stone that appeared in front of it, and at that moment, I made the B-rank stone use its awakening skill, internal reflection, and counterattack with triple damage. Oh! It finally got damaged. Several cracks formed in Bibi's bright red exoskeleton, leaking purple bodily fluids. At that moment, Karina's body began to shimmer. Karina used her extra skill, Limit Break, to attack the cracked and less durable BB with all her might at that opportunity. Karina's attacks further cracked BB's exoskeleton. Karina, you can finish this. Hit it. Yes. At that moment, BB changed the target of its attack from Karina to Dagora. It used its large jaws to pinch Dagora. Gua! No, Karina. Strike the big jaw that's holding Dagora. I get it. Bibi, not caring that Dagora was surprised and trying to escape, pinched Dagora's large shield and armor together with a cracking sound and tried to cut him in half. Karina panicked and struck an attack that combined the extra skill, limit-breaking, and the Sword King's skill into one of Bibi's jaws. 
The same attack that was able to damage a transformed demon general was also able to damage Bibi. One of Bibi's jaws cracked and Dogora was free. Dogora, are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. He is bleeding from both arms because he was pinched by a large jaw, but Dogora said he was fine. After he replied, recovery magic rained down on Dogora from Kiel. It would have been bad if Dogora didn't have a big shield. But thanks to you, a lot of damage has been done. As the fierce battle continued, Bibi got considerably weaker as we worked together to attack it. Cracks were everywhere on its body and purple fluid was leaking out. And one of Bibi's jaws was heavily abraded due to Karina's full power attack. We're almost there. We are going to defeat it. Oh! It was then. Bibi approached a rank stone. Huh? Then, Bibi pinched it with its big jaws, not caring that one of them was heavily injured. Then Bibi's body started glowing. What? Energy drain? I knew immediately what Bibi was doing. I then immediately called the Birang stone to my card, but it was too late. The heavily injured jaw and the cracks that had spread throughout Bibi's body were almost completely healed. Ah, it used its healing method after nearly being defeated. It can't use recovery magic, but it has a means of recovery. Hey, what are we going to do? Okay, it can't be helped. Everyone. In the worst case scenario that Bibi was completely, I turned everyone's attention on our next move. Let's get the hell out of here. If we continue to fight against Bibi, we will get injured or worse suffer casualties. We are not its match currently. What? Okay. Okay. I made the decision that we could not defeat it as we were. No one, including Cecile, disagreed. We had decided to retreat. Okay, not a shadow of the beast men. The party of beast men was already gone when we started escaping. Alan and his friends used Birank birds to escape. Chapter 240 Golems My friends and I ran away from the blood blast beetle, aka BB, like rabbits. Since Bibi had recovered all the damage it had received in the fight, we were unlikely to defeat it even if we lost. I had defeated many magical beasts who had such healing ability in my previous life by moving around and not getting caught. However, if a party member were to get caught, the chance of defeating it would drop drastically. I decided that even if we were to persist and win, it would have been at the expense of someone. The slower the decision was made, the more the risk everyone was at. I believed that the party leader had to have the ability to make decisions quickly. BB was highly durable and fast, but we had no problem just running away. We were not going to get sneak attacked by BB. My friends and I were on B-rank birds who were using their awakening skill, soar. And if I wanted to, I could use my summons as decoys to be able to ensure our escape. I even had time to choose a place and lead it to a place where there were no adventurers nearby. After some distance, Bibi stopped chasing us, so I also verified how far it would chase us. I decided to investigate Bibi while collecting medals by defeating other floor bosses. I wanted to know the search range and how long it had to be left unattended for to respawn about the magical beasts. Since there were no adventurers who were willing to hunt Bibi, it was a good target for such experiments. Apparently, if the magical beats didn't come in contact with adventurers for an hour or so, they disappear and appear randomly at another location. In my opinion, the S-Class dungeon lived up to its name with something like that even on the second floor. And it was no wonder to me that half of the adventurers died within a year. Over the next half day, we hunted the floor bosses as best we could and were able to obtain three bronze medals. After defeating a floor boss, a large medal fell to the ground along with the magic stone. For some reason, we were unable to find the treasure chests that I had expected to find. It was hard to imagine that there was not a single treasure chest in a 100 kilometers radius. 
I concluded that the treasure chest had spawned in a position that was difficult to find with earank birds, clairvoyance. Clairvoyance couldn't search over obstacles after all. Now, let's leave this damned awkward floor and move on to the next one. You're still saying that? Of course. I haven't seen anything like this in a long time. After a long time, you say? Dogora, in dismay, went along with my words. We couldn't defeat the floor bosses because this floor is like a new map. I will never hunt on this floor again. In online games, new dungeons, fields, etc. were sometimes implemented through version upgrades. That often caused a rush of players and the number of players often outnumbered the number of enemies. I felt the same way on the second floor. There was a cube-shaped object floating in front of us that was going to take us to the third floor. Hello, abandoned gamers. This is S201, the dungeon management system. Would you like to go to the next floor? Or would you like to go back to the previous floor? Go to the third floor. Please give me three bronze medals to go to the third floor. Here. I gave three bronze medals to the cube-shaped object. The medals had patterns of chickens and lizards. I found out when I got a bronze medal that not all medals were the same. A pattern that looks like a deformed version of a defeated magical beast was carved in the metal, which was made of bronze. I have certainly received three bronze medals. Let's go to the third floor. The moment the cube-shaped object said so, my friends and I were transferred. Hum, M, this is the third floor, nothing much different, huh? Hum? The ground is sand. So it's a desert field. I looked at the third floor. My friends too, who had arrived, looked around to see if there were any changes in the empty space where the adventurers were. Since the ground had changed from soil to sand, we knew that the third floor was a desert. For some reason, there seems to be a lot of dwarves on this floor. Let's take a look at the whole place. Yes. Cecile answered me. Using an earank bird, I saw a square about one kilometer long on each side, just like the second floor. And away from the square, the desert continued, with sand rippling in places. The terrain looked like a hill dotted here and there with chunks of rock. Oh! It's a golem. There are a lot of them. As usual, they are different from the golem I was expecting, but is this floor advantageous for golem users? Compared to the second floor, the third floor had more golems strutting over the desert. There were golems on the second floor as well, but they had little of the mechanic feel I was expecting. They were not robots at all, but were like puppet dolls. The golems had shiny copper sheen and weren't too burly. They had long hands that almost touched the ground. They had a head, but it would be buried in the chest area, so their hands grew out of the torso area in a flowing curve from shoulder height. And although I was told they were 100 meters tall, most of them were only about 10 meters. There were apparently some 100 meter tall golems, but they were very rare. The dwarves controlled the golems by sitting inside their crystal belly. There were a lot of beast men on the second floor. I pondered why it was. Perhaps the second floor, consisting of forests and grasslands, was advantageous for the beast men, who were quicker and allowed them to earn money faster. A floor composed of forests and grasslands where floor bosses could be found and defeated quickly. So there were many beast men on the second floor. Perhaps the beast men had some ability or something that allowed them to find many treasure chests that we could not find. Come to think of it, I didn't see that beast man you are again. Well, I don't plan to go to the second floor in the future, so maybe I won't see him again. I didn't meet the party of beast men that we had rescued yesterday. He talked about thanking us, but I didn't particularly want to urge them to do so, and there was no use of any thank you that I would get from adventurers who used the second floor as their primary place of activity. Nor did I expect to hear any information about the dungeon from them that I couldn't find. I didn't even know how many bronze medals, which cost 100 gold coins each, could they give us in exchange for their gratitude. 
I didn't think we were ever going to meet again, as we had no intention of seeking them out ourselves to get a thank you. I see. Is this what Admiral Galera was talking about? I noticed something as I watched the golems strolling through the desert. What's wrong? Alan. Oh, Cecile. Apparently, dwarves have an advantage in this desert. What do you mean? I had noticed something, so I gathered to share information. There were many parties on the third floor, consisting of only golem users. However, there were also some parties with beastmen, humans, and dwarves. What do you mean? Well, Merle. This desert apparently has a magical beast in the sand that is attacking us. It looks like the golems get attacked first, and they protect the party. A scorpion-like magical beast attacked a golem advancing through the desert from the sand. While the golem had its hard armor that blocked the attack, the party's friends moved to surround it and the battle began. I predicted it was so because the golem was sturdy and resistant to surprise attacks. Some of the parties had beast men on the golem's high shoulders, scouting the area from a higher vantage point. Climbing onto the golem's shoulders would protect them from danger, killing two birds with one stone. Admiral Galera must have been aware of the situation on the third floor when he said that on the second floor. Dwarf golem users were very useful on the third floor. We'll have to work hard to find at least five stone slabs. M.M. Hum. I won't say it out loud because of Merle, but the Baki's empire is a ripoff. Like 3,000 gold coins for one iron slab? In order to use the magic board to produce a golem, stone slabs had to be fitted into the magic board. There were ten dents in a magic board into which stone slabs could be fitted. To produce a golem, one needed five basic stone slabs, called basic stone slabs. These five stone slabs, head, body, right hand, left hand, and foot, when fitted with the magic board, the most minimum version of golem were completed. It was not enough just to collect five, but it was necessary to collect those exact five, one for each part of the body. The temple would buy back any unwanted slab at 100 gold coins for any part if it was bronze rank and 300 gold coins for iron rank. But the temple didn't only buy the unwanted slabs, they also sold them. However, to buy a basic stone slab of a golem, whether bronze or iron, one had to pay ten times the selling price for a chapter. One bronze basic stone slab for 1,000 gold coins, whereas the iron ones went for 3,000 gold coins. If someone wanted to buy all basic stone slabs for an iron golem, they needed 15,000 gold coins. It would require twice of what I had. I couldn't afford it. Oh! There's something great out there. What? Where? I raised my voice, so Merle and everyone else reacted. There's a golem gliding on the sand. Oh! Is this the effect of a special slab? I recalled what Merle had told me about the possibilities of a golem. Golems had considerable utility outside of combat. I had just seen a golem gliding over the sand through the earank bird. The lower half of the golem's body was like a boat, and it moved easily over the sand. I could also see some adventurers on top of the golem. That was the effect of a special slab. Some of the stone slabs that could be fitted into the dents of the magic board could change the function and shape of the golem. Merle told me that there were also stone tablets for special purposes that allowed a golem to advance through the sea or fly in the sky. At all costs, we need to find a special stone slab that transforms the golem into a house. I had one particular one that I wanted. Some of the stone slabs allowed the golem to become a house. I had heard that it was as solid as a fortress and people could even sleep inside. Now, this is exciting. Let's hear the conditions for going to the next floor, and maybe even collect some stone slabs. At a single word from Alan, his friends moved on to their next action. Chapter 241 Third Floor 1 I was reminded of the usefulness and potential of the golems when I saw them in action on the third floor. 
I guess we'll have to collect the basic stone slabs for the main body as soon as possible and go to the next floor. Where is the best place to level up my friends? I also need to collect magic stones. I don't know why, but I'm really excited about having so much to do. Is Digragni a god as well? No, he's about to become a god. My friends had only had their talents changed once, so I wanted to raise their levels while collecting the stone slabs. I had a lot of things I wanted to do, like collecting stone slabs and magic stones, so I was feeling very excited. I also needed to earn 1,000 gold coins in 5 days to collect D-rank magic stones from the Adventurer's Guild. The S-Class Dungeon, Tower of Trials, seemed to be full of challenging elements. With gratitude to the dungeon master, Digragni, I walked over to the cube-shaped object. As with the second floor, there seemed to be a cube-shaped object on the third floor that would guide us to the next floor. Since there was a cube-shaped object right in front of us, I decided to learn the conditions required to go to the fourth floor before exploring the third floor. Welcome, abandoned gamers. This is S301, the dungeon management system. Would you like to go to the next floor? Or go back to the first floor? Huh? Oh, come on. Seriously? What's wrong? I was upset, so Karina asked why I was. No, Karina. Let me just check. Yeah. Excuse me. Can't we go back from the third floor to the second floor? Sorry, you can only move to the next floor or to the first floor. Ha! Huh. We will need many medals. What? Is this S-Class Dungeon just a metal game? Ha! Huh. My friends understood the meaning of my words. We needed medals to get to the next floor. And if medals were needed every time we wanted to advance to the next floor, it would mean that we had to use medals to go up each time from the first floor. I want to go to the next floor. I wanted to know the conditions for advancing to the next floor. To go to the fourth floor, please give me four bronze medals and four iron medals. I don't have them. We don't have a single medal. Seriously, we need bronze medals too? Hey, hey! What is this? The number of medals we need keeps increasing. Cecile recalled the agony that we had to go through for half a day just to get three bronze medals. My other friends were immensely impressed. At that time, I somehow understood the difficulty of conquering the S-Class dungeon. The higher one went in the dungeon, the more medals they would need. So, we'll have to consider staying in the dungeon. It seems so. Sophie responded with a hand on her cheek with an expression that said that she was in trouble. We went to the trouble of renting a property near the dungeon, but found out that the specifications required that many medals when we left the dungeon each day. I remembered seeing the adventurers resting in the plaza on the third floor. They were resting in the dungeon, perhaps because of the specification that the medals were required each time. There must have been parties of adventurers who had been sleeping there for days. For now, let's keep track of the dungeon and collect the medals. It was easy to imagine that iron medals would be important in the dungeon. I summoned B-rank birds. They flew into the sky amidst the amazement of the resting adventurers. Hum, there are a fair number of adventurers here, but it's not crowded. But there's a problem. Is every magical beast except for the ones fighting in the sand? How do I search for them? Hum? The third floor was not crowded with only about 20% to 30% of the adventurers who were active on the second floor being there. I looked around through Earink Bird, but I couldn't find any magical beasts roaming on the surface. The magical beasts out on the surface were already in battle with a party of adventurers. In the midst of all that, one party of adventurers approached a rocky mountain about the size of a mountain dotted in the sand. It appeared to be a fairly large party of adventurers numbering in the dozens. Mem, what's this? Oh! There's a hole in the rock mountain. Hum? Is there something in the hole? 
while I checked on the adventurers with my ear ink bird, the adventurers began to form up in front of a gaping hole in the large rock mountain. The adventurers seemed eager to engage in a battle. Two golems stood in the front, with the adventurers in the rear guard. Lightly armed archers stood on the golems' shoulders. Two or so beast men, who appeared to be scouts, slowly walked into the hole. After some time, they came running out as if they were being chased at a great speed. From behind, they came scorpion magical beasts. The mountain didn't look that big, but more and more scorpion magical beasts came pouring out. Then one large scorpion magical beast appeared from behind dozens of scorpion magical beasts. The battle between the adventurers and the magical beasts began. The battle was proceeding in favor of the adventurers, as they were well formed. I see, there are magical beasts in the mountains too? So it's not just in the sand. Hum? Was this the same on the second floor? Come to think of it, there were large trees growing there. As the party of adventurers engaged in battle, I was reminded of the second floor, which consisted of forests and grasslands. Indeed, the second floor also had large trees scattered at intervals of several kilometers. I had the earank bird, which was still flying on the second floor, to head for a very prominent large tree. The tree had a large hole in it. All the large trees seemed to have open holes in them. Hum, are there treasure chests or magical beasts in these places? The trees on the second floor are not as big as the rocky mountains on the third floor, so maybe all of them have treasure chests. I see. I see. I expected the large trees or rocky mountains to have a magical beast or treasure chest in them. Adventurers were searching through the trees on the second floor or the rocky mountains on the third floor while retrieving treasure chests or defeating magical beasts. What's wrong? Merle asked me, who was still thinking? Somehow, I'm beginning to see how we should attack this floor. Really? Yeah, let's go to that rocky mountain over there for a minute. We headed for a rocky mountain where no one seemed to be around to confirm that what I had noticed was correct. This is the place. You all be careful, there might be some enemies out there. With that, Karina and Dagora led the group to a spot a short distance away from the big hole in the rocky mountain. Then, after getting into the formation, I sent Birank spirits into the hole. Hum? There's nothing here. Huh? I saw through Birank spirit that the large hole in the rocky mountain that was large enough for an Airank magical beast to enter and exit was a bit like a cave. I hoped to find a magical beast, but I reached a dead end and found nothing. Maybe there's not always something there. Let's try another rocky mountain. I used Airank birds, clairvoyance, and found that there were more than 100 rocky mountains in the third floor's cast, wavy desert. Since we had just started to look into it, I decided to check another rocky mountain. When we arrived there, we formed the same formation and I sent Birank spirits into it. But nothing happened. Again, nothing. But there seem to be a lot of adventurers who are hunting magical beasts targeting rocky mountains like this. Checking the movements of the other adventurer parties, it seemed to me that they were divided into two main groups. One was a party of adventurers who roamed the desert and hunted magical beasts. The others were a party of adventurers moving towards a rocky mountain. I didn't give up after the second failure and went to the third rocky mountain. I sent Birank spirit inside again. I went deep into the room and thought there was nothing there, but then something like a magic circle with many geometric characters appeared. Kish! Then, from the magic circle, a large number of scorpion magical beasts appeared and filled the cave. Chapter 242 Third Floor 2 They're coming! At my call, my friends who had already formed a formation shifted into a more ready stance. Dozens of scorpion magical beasts came out of the big hole. They were coming toward us, but as per our strategy, we didn't break formation and intercepted them. It was common knowledge that fighting in formation rather than individually was better. Wah! 
With a shout, Karina's greatsword slammed into the head of an oncoming scorpion magical beast. The head of the scorpion magical beast dipped into the sandy ground, spraying bodily fluids. You have defeated one rock scorpion. You have acquired 24,000 experience. It's a B-rank magical beast. They're small fry. I guess I'll just have to take them down at once. Okay, Cecile. Go for it. I figured out the rank of the magical beast from the amount of experience they gave. Tens of thousands of experience was a sign of a B-rank magical beast. For my friends and I, who had hunted millions of magical beasts in the Rosenheim War, B-rank magical beasts were no longer a threat. Oh! FOMO! The giant scissor-like tentacles of a magical beast larger than the scorpion we had been fighting against slammed into Dagora's large shield with an impact sound. To protect our formation, Dagora tried to stave off the blow from the scorpion magical beast much larger than others, but he was forced backwards, leaving a sly trail of sandy scaffolding in his wake. That's an A rank. Dagora, hold it back for a while, please. Everyone else, target the small fries first. Numbers were fundamentals of a battle. While fighting a few dozen or so magical beasts, it is better to destroy the magical beasts that serve as small fries before defeating the big boss, which will reduce the damage you receive. Hurry up! When a magical beast reached A rank, its power jumped dramatically. With a wry smile, Dagora held down the scorpion magical beast more than ten times his own size. Then, yet another large scorpion magical beast came out of the big hole. Karina, here comes another one. What? Chaosus. Yet another magical beast of the same size as the one Dagora was holding down appeared, so I had Karina deal with it. However, one more magical beast that was even larger than the scorpion magical beast that Dagora was holding back came out. This guy is probably a floor boss. We are fighting against a floor boss, but try to save your extra skills as long as you can. Oh, Dagora, you can use your extra skill anytime you want. As if remembering, I added. Ah. I know that. We had decided to save our extra skills as much as possible as a safety precaution in case we ran into some danger in the S-Class dungeon. Extra skills had a one-day cool time and could only be used once per day. We had just started hunting in the dungeon that morning, so we were going to fight a series of battles. There were S-rank magical beasts on the third floor as well, so we wanted to conserve as much as possible for that occasion. As an exception, Dogora was the only one who could use his extra skill at any time, and Dogora was dissatisfied with that. Karina was given the task of dealing with the scorpion magical beast of the same size as the one Dogora was holding down. When we had almost defeated all the B-rank rock scorpions, I sent a B-rank stone toward the magical beast that seemed to be the floor boss, which emerged from the hole. Both Dagora and Karina had their hands full trying to hold down the scorpion magical beasts, which we believed to be of A-rank. The A-rank magical beasts were still a formidable foe for Karina and Dagora. Without using their extra skill, Karina and Dagora had no way of defeating A-rank magical beasts. These guys are weak against ice magic. Oh, they have a weak attribute? That will be quite helpful. Cecile was checking the effectiveness of her different attributes of magic by comparing the amount of damage they cause. The damage dealt by ice magic was higher than when she used other attributes. Okay. You guys defeat the one Karina is holding back first. Sophie, water magic is closest to ice magic, so use water spirit magic. Okay. We were fighting against three A-rank or higher magical beasts, so we needed to reduce their number first. I helped Dagora hold back his opponent while Sophie, Cecile and Fermar helped Karina defeat the scorpion magical beast she was fighting. Should I set aside more slots for summons for times like this? No, now is the time to be patient, considering that this patience will lead to greater efficiency in the future. I could summon up to 70 summons at once, but I had restricted that number to 10 at that time. 
To be able to farm skill experience faster, I had about 50 B-rank fish in my holder that had increased my mana. If I don't raise my summon to level 8 soon, we may not be able to cope with the demons attacking us or with more pinch moments in the future than we are in now. During our climb of the tower, I chose not to summon too many summons, to farm more skill experience and to promote the growth of my friends. My friends had been going to the dungeon with me since Academy. We participated in the war in Rosenheim together and became much better at coordination and fighting. But there was no right answer to the battle. Even in what might seem to be the best way to fight, there were always better ways. When my friend's talents and status changed, the battle formation that seemed optimal till that point had to be changed. I had talked with my friends to ensure that we were always fighting at our best. While I was thinking about that, we were able to defeat both A-rank magical beasts. No, it's pretty tough with just me healing. Well, I know it's hard on the healers, but it's just another practice. Heal. During the war, I used, blessing of heaven, like water, but I wasn't planning to use one until it was absolutely necessary in that fight. It was important to store them for a day that they would be needed, and also because I could store them in my inventory endlessly without any drawbacks. I was only going to use, blessing of heaven, at the very last minute, but I intended to use, mana seed, like water, since I could just collect D-rank magic stones from the Adventurer's Guild. Mana Seed restored the mana of all the allies by 1,000 within a radius of 50 meters. Thanks to that, Kiel's recovery magic was the lifeblood of the party. You have defeated one death scorpion. You have acquired 200,000 experience. Okay, only one left now. It defeated two mirrors, but I was able to hurt it a lot as well. With my words, we targeted the last and largest scorpion magical beast. Hey Alan, you don't think that big thing is an S rank, do you? No, that guy is a high A rank. I was assured that it was not an S rank. I knew that before we even started fighting. Well, yes. It is a lot weaker than BB. Cecile, too, had no doubt when I said so. The last scorpion magical beast to emerge had cracks all over its sturdy-looking exoskeleton and was spewing bodily fluids. It was injured because it was hit by B-rank stone's awakening skill, internal reflection, three times. It wasn't that smart as it tried to deliver a powerful blow, and at that time I ordered B-rank stone to use, internal reflection. Both Karina and Dogora prioritize attacking where cracks had formed, so the scorpion magical beast that seemed to be the floor boss plotted about with loud cries. Sophie, Cecile, and Fermar provided cover from a distance to prevent Karina and Dogora from being hit by its large scissor-like tentacles and huge, taut tails. As Karina and Dogora protected the rearguards, Sophie and Cecile protected the vanguards. You have defeated one death scorpion king. You have acquired 4 million experience. On the cover of the grimoire, a log of the defeat of the last magical beast, the Death Scorpion King, was displayed. Oh! We got a medal. It's the floor boss after all. Oh! Great! 200 gold coins! Keel, who was farthest behind, rushed to the medal. When everyone rushed to the spot where the Death Scorpion King had been defeated and turned into a glowing bubble, one A-rank magic stone and a scorpion-patterned iron metal fell. The S-class dungeon didn't leave behind any materials, just like the Academy City's dungeon. If you defeat a magical beast, it will only drop magical stones, so if you need materials for a magical beast, you must defeat the beast outside of the dungeon. It seemed that one metal would always be available from the floor boss. One of these cost 200 gold coins. No wonder everyone wants to go to the dungeon. If I want to buy all the medals with gold coins to go from third floor to fourth floor, it will cost us 1200 gold coins. Yes. I think being here is going to change my perception of money. Well, I'm with Alan, so that might have already changed a long time ago. I said sincerely, clutching the iron medal which was received by Cecile's satire. So are we going inside the cave? No, Karina. 
There doesn't seem to be anything in the cave. I had already confirmed with Birang spirits that the cave was empty after the magical beasts had left. I see. Well, let's go to the next hunting ground. Karina grabbed her greatsword and huffed. Yeah, that way. I already had my sights set on our next target as I had already sent Birang spirits on the next rocky mountain while we were fighting. For that reason, it could be said that I hardly used any of my summons in that battle. After recovering the magic stone and metal, Alan and his friends headed for the next rocky mountain. Chapter 243 Kenichi Having discovered that the magical beasts were lurking in the Rocky Mountains, my friends and I continued to attack the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains were probably what was called the spawn, ointment for magical beasts. Since only using Beerank spirits for finding the spawning mountains was inefficient, I had Beerank fishes, whom I had in large numbers in my holder for increasing my mana, swim in the sand and head for the Rocky Mountains. I found out because of them swimming in the sand that there were quite a few magical beasts there. A Beerank magical beast was not enough to defeat a Beerank fish that had fairly high durability, but there were other Arank magical beasts on the third floor besides the floor bosses, and against such enemies, my summons took some damage. If they encountered a magical beast and were going to get defeated, I summoned them within Kiel's range and had them healed. I did so to reduce my unnecessary magic stone expenditure. We spent the entire morning hunting for magical beasts in the Rocky Mountains and were also able to find a treasure chest. There was a treasure chest in a Rocky Mountain. As for hunting magical beasts, some Rocky Mountains had floor bosses while others didn't. Our results after the morning battle were as follows. 3 Iron Medals Hit Hurricane Helmet and Sword in addition to them, we also obtained A-rank and B-rank magic stones. I think this is a good place to raise our levels. I guess so. We can just stay here until we can change talents again. We can spend a month here leveling up then. We'll continue our search for magical beasts and stone slabs in the afternoon. We had been told that we could find stone slabs in the treasure chests, but all we found were weapons and armor. We were planning to continue working on collecting stone slabs in the afternoon. I'm sorry. For me. Merle said gloomily. Oh. Suddenly you seem to have lost your energy. I had given Merle a large shield to guard Cecile and Sophie until we collected enough slabs for her golem. Merle, who knew how strong a golem was, was confident at first but after knowing that her friends had changed talents only once and were clearly stronger than when they were at the academy, she began to feel useless in battle. We ended up spending all morning getting four medals and two treasure chests, but no stone slabs. To me, it was just a matter of time, as I knew we would find it eventually, but as for Merle, she was anxious. Well, that's all right. It's not like it's going to take months to get the golem together. We got two treasure chests in just half a day. It's just a matter of time. But. I think your power is full of possibilities that can't be measured by simple strength. Besides, it's obvious from the other golems that you will be very useful as a tank. I told Merle that we knew how useful and strong a golem could be. Yeah. Somehow Merle seemed to agree. Then again, Alan is obsessed with tanks. M.M.? That's not true. I just know a little bit about it. My conditioned reflex was to deny it. When you put it that way, yes. Sophie seemed to agree with Cecile's words. I got the why the tank look. Hum. Well, not to hide it, but I used to be a tank in my past life. Heh. I see. That's why you know a lot. Cecile recalled me speaking passionately about the importance of the role of a tank. My friends seemed surprised that I did so. Having seen me as a summon, they thought that I used to play as summoner or something similar in my previous life. Well, I didn't want to tank, but I don't need to tell them. Yes, so Merle. I chose to be a summoner myself, but you never know until you try it. 
if you do it for a long time, you get attached to it. Being a summon in this world was not what I had expected, but I truly was having fun as a summoner. So I told Merle not to worry if she didn't like being a tank at first. I see. It's kind of persuasive. It's called experience. In my previous life, in the first online game I ever played, I chose to play as a tank. There were a number of classes available, but the one I chose was tank because it looked strong. I didn't choose to be a tank, my chosen class happened to be tank. Since it was my first time playing an online game, I had no concept of a tank in his mind. Compared to other vanguard positions, I just thought that the one I chose was less aggressive, more durable, and had the skills to protect his allies. It was more than a year after I started playing that I learned about the position of tank in detail. I believe I fulfilled my role as a tank until the end of the online game service. The first and last time I mainly played as a tank was in my first online game. So, it's no exaggeration to say that I didn't know what it was but grew to like it. I was in this world because I cherished the memories of those days. The strong memories of the online games I was hooked on at the time determined my subsequent gaming life and values. And as a result, I came to this world because I wanted to do it. But you used to be a tank, right? Did you change your talent? M.M.? Yes. I said tartly. What? What's that? My reaction to Sophie's realization made Cecile feel more uncomfortable than ever. Clearly, she was hiding something. What do you mean what? Say it right. What talent did you have later? Cecile, who had been eating, nudged and stuffed herself. What Alan used to do? Karina also joined in on Cecile's questioning. I was an adventurer. What else but a great adventurer? Hi. Why? Oh, that hurts. No, seriously. Re, that's inexcusable. AI blurted out Karina's answer and was sanctioned by Cecile in her iron claw. You said? I wore armor and my weapons were a spear and a sword. I also had shields. Brings back fond memories of Kenichi. I played my first online game under the name Kenichi. I played that game for the first time when I was a student and could not think of a cool name for it, so I named it after myself. Oh. Cool. Karina imagined my previous life and asked further what it was like. I wanted to change the situation, but I was running out of places to run to. Yeah, very cool. But you just said your equipment, not talent. Hey, Sophie. Aren't you supposed to be on my side? I mean. Sophie also seemed to be inevitably curious about my previous talent. There was not the slightest hint of kindness in her eyes seeing Cecile holding on to me. Apparently, I was alone there without any allies. Wait. It hurts. You'll tell me, won't you? Yes, ma'am. I was actually a holy knight. I chose it because I thought it was a cool talent, both the equipment and the name. It was the moment of the birth of Kenichi, the holy knight. When the first online game I played was discontinued and I looked at a number of online games I played after that, I found that most of the heavily armed talents, such as holy knight, were tanks. It was simply that Kenichi was ignorant at the time. I'm a knight. Alan was a knight. That's amazing. Hey, you were a knight. Why didn't you tell me? Karina and Dagora stood up and reacted strongly to my words. See, I knew Karina and Dagora would react this way. Now, I have to clear up this misunderstanding. I knew how much the two of them admired knights from when we were kids playing knights. So when I confessed to them, I only told them that I had memories of my previous life and had several talents in my previous life, but I hid the fact that I had been a holy knight, a talent with the word knight in it. Don't get me wrong. It was just my talent. It just had the word knight in it, but its status was the same as that of a commoner. I was a salaryman. 
Of course not. Dogora, who had been quietly looking at us thinking, just the usual Cecile and Alan, rebutted me like never before. Hum? Cube? It's a cube. The earank bird, who was scouting, found a cube-shaped object floating at the back of the cave. Oh, just as Helmios told me yesterday. Hey, what are you talking about? No, I found a cube out in the Rocky Mountain Cave. Everyone has already taken a break. Let's go. Oh, hey. We're not done talking. Let me hear more about the night. I mean, why did you keep quiet? With Dagora's voice in the background, Alan summoned Beerank birds and urged them to depart, brushing off everyone's questioning faces. Chapter 244 Hidden Cube Brushing aside everyone's protests to tell them the story of my previous life, I summoned Beerank birds and left. Hey, you have to tell us more about being a holy knight later. Don't even think of escaping. Alan. Hum. I silently accepted Cecile's words as she flew in from behind in a strong tone. I have to wait for the storm to pass. Well, I finally found it. But we were really lucky to find it on the first day after hearing about it. I had told my friends that we were going to stay in the dungeon for four days and three nights starting that day. The square where we were transferred to was not infested with magical beasts, and other adventurers' parties were all lodged in that place as they wished. Some parties used golems who had a special plate to transform into a house and slept inside. If night were to fall, I had no way of escape, but I had postponed the problem. I had heard last night that there was a hidden cube somewhere on the third floor. The place where I heard that news was the imperial capital of the Jayamut Empire, the residence of hero King Helmios near the royal castle. I had stationed one Birank spirit there. Through that Birank spirit, I asked him about Bibi and other additional information that I was missing at the start. Since Helmios was working mainly on the fourth floor, he had information about the second and third floors, although he told me he didn't know Mu chapter. In addition to the Helmios mansion, I had spread my summons all over the world. While the capital of Rosenheim, Fortania, was under reconstruction, so my summon was in Tiamo with the queen and the elders. In a mansion near the royal capital of the Ladash kingdom where an elf diplomat was living. Viscount Grandel's mansion in Grandver City. Rodden Development Village. I had placed them in various parts of the world to gather information, as my friends and I were going to stay in the S-Class dungeon for a long period of time. I had done so in case the Demon King's army invaded and I didn't know about it. I had placed one summon in the development village where my family lived, both to help with the construction work and to protect them from magical beasts. To me, the most valuable thing in the world was a thriving family. In addition, I had left one Beerank dragon in Viscount Granville and Baron Carnell's territory to defeat magical beasts there. It was also in charge of raising Haku, the white dragon, so it was quite busy. Haku's food would be the most abundant food among the magical beasts the dragon would defeat, but Haku continued to eat with an unbelievable appetite and was growing larger every day. My friends and I entered a large hole in the Rocky Mountain. Thank goodness. It hasn't disappeared yet. Everyone, I'm going to talk to you, so brace yourselves. Behind the large hole in the Rocky Mountain, there was a cube-shaped object identical to the one in the square. Hum. Okay. As he said so, Fermat removed the bow from his back and held it over his chest. I'm going, then. Excuse me. I, too, was wary, but spoke to the cube-shaped object nonetheless. Hello, abandoned gamers. This is the Dungeon Reward Exchange System S302. Would you like to exchange your medals for stone tablets? Not the trap, but the exchange system? An exchange? Excuse me, may I ask you a few questions? Please. I decided to check out the details of what the cube-shaped object could do. Only iron-class stone slabs and metals could be exchanged. Metal could be exchanged for a stone slab or vice versa. 
the exchange rate was one stone slab equals three metals. You can only exchange once. If you want to exchange metals for stone slabs, you will get one randomly selected basic stone slab. Special stone slabs require different number of metals on piece-by-piece -piece basis. Helmios told me that there were more than one cube-shaped object on the floor. He said that they appeared somewhere on the floor, and after a period of time, they would respawn at another location like the floor bosses. They could often, but not exclusively, be found in the large trees on the second floor and in large holes in rocky mountains on the third floor. The exchange rate was fixed for the basic stone slabs, but we could also get a wide range of special stone slabs, such as those for gigantism, reinforcement, mobility for more metals. The number of metals required depended on the type of stone slab being exchanged. Some exchanges required more than 10 metals. Furthermore, the cube-shaped objects didn't just exchange metals and stone slabs. Sometimes they gave out metals or stone slabs for free. Other times, they transferred the founder to a bonus stage, death stage, and other locations outside of the normal floor. The transfer to the death stage is said to be a forced transfer to another space with a large number of magical beasts. As a result, the founding parties are sometimes surrounded by hordes of A-rank magical beasts and wiped out, which was apparently one of the reasons why there were so many wipeouts in the dungeon. It seemed to be common knowledge among adventurers that you should never talk to a hidden cube when you're not competent. I want to trade three iron medals for a basic stone slab. Without hesitation, I pulled out three iron medals from inventory. Merle's golem is a playful little thing. None of my friends stopped me as I generously exchanged the three iron medals we had obtained after running through the third floor all morning. They knew from our time in the academy that I always sought the best strength for my friends, after all. Confirmed. Here is your item. Three iron medals disappeared from my hand. And the stone slab for an iron golem appeared and started floating softly as if it had lost gravity. Is this for the head? This is the first one. Just four more to go. I hope we don't get the head one again. Well, we will suffer repeats when we will only have one left. Thanks. We had spent our entire morning's hard work to exchange for a stone slab. Merle was probably upset by our lack of hesitation as she tried to thank us. Here, try fitting this in the magic board. Uh-huh. Oh. Merle inserted the head stone slab in one of the dents that I assumed to be for the golem's head. Merle was sorry, but she was able to take a step forward and her expression changed from anxiety to joy. Alan is so generous. He really was a holy knight. He must have a big heart. Yes, because he was a holy knight at that time too. I see. So that's why he is used to dealing with royalty and nobility. Cecile seemed to be concerned about the whole holy knight thing. She said there was something about my actions and statements in the past that convinced her. Kiel made a statement that added further conviction to Cecile's words, and everyone else nodded in agreement. Something about this just keeps getting more and more wrong. I, who was no longer able to say that I chose it just because I thought it was cool when I was in school, endeavored to be unresponsive. But if I had said that the Holy Knight looked cool, Karina and Dagora would have reacted even more strongly. It was easy to imagine the two of them wanting to be Holy Knights. The cube-shaped object slowly disappeared as if losing its outline. Oh, it disappears when it finishes its roll? Well, next time. Let's move towards the next Rocky Mountain. There's a treasure chest over there, so let's get it before it disappears. As expected of Master Alan. Sophie, who played the role of the praiser, clasped her hands on her chest and said that she was impressed. I sincerely hoped that the misunderstanding that Cecile and others were having could be cleared up. It was the second day after we entered the S-Class dungeon that I began to see so many clues about the strategy. I was constantly using summons to have them check the Rocky Mountains. The other adventuring parties had to move in a corresponding formation as the magical beasts could attack from the sand while they were moving. 
Then they again had to change their formation in case there were magical beasts in the Rocky Mountains. Thanks to that, they had to waste so much time. But my friends and I didn't have to do that. I had more than one O summons to search the Rocky Mountains without loss of time and without rest. What? My vision changed all at once. While traveling with my friends on the Beerank bird, the view of the Beerank fish I was using sharing on changed. M.M.? I mean, are we in the air? Jembu is flying through the air. What's wrong? Alan. Merle noticed something unusual about me. Why are you stopping again? Cecile protested from behind as I had stopped in midair. No, I think I saw Scarlet. I saw a long vermilion torso for a moment, but Jembu was going to get hit. Let's go over there for a minute. What? Scarlet is the S-rank floor boss of this floor, right? Why are we going there? If I can't defeat it, we can just run away again. I just want to see what kind of magical beast it is. It is close to here. S-ranks are not invincible. I want to defeat them. It was only the day before that we had to flee from BB, an S-rank magical beast, the second floor boss. Alan's friends had tensed expressions on their faces as Alan decided to change their destination to an S-rank magical beast. Chapter 245 Scarlet 1 I asked Helmios about the names and characteristics of the S-rank floor bosses on the third floor. My friends and I flew towards the only S-rank floor boss on the third floor, a magical beast called Scarlet. This is terrible. Jembu's is nearly 100 meters up in the air. The B-rank fish, which looked like a 10-meter-long archelon, which should have been swimming in the sand, was far above in the sky. I concluded that Scarlet had dragged him out of the ground by force and lifted him up into the air. My summons had weight, and the B-rank fish was one of my heaviest summon. Alan, they're all running away. Adventurers frantically fled from Scarlet, who suddenly appeared out of the sand and ran across the sand. None of the adventurers wanted to fight it. Yeah, I understand why they are running away from that one. Ah, Jembu. Before my eyes, the B-rank fish, which was caught by Scarlet, disappeared in a glowing bubble. The magical beast that defeated my B-rank fish summon was a huge worm-shaped magical beast, Scarlet. This is the strongest boss on this floor, Scarlet, the sandworm. How big is it? Nice, nice. This is good. Alan, what are you talking about? We can't do this. Merle stared in despair at the overwhelmingly strong magical beast crawling out of the sand. What are you talking about? There is no such thing as an invincible enemy. Scarlet had a long, worm-like body, which was more than several hundred meters long, vermilion in color, with spines growing out of its node-like parts. As my friends pulled away, I couldn't stop my heart from beating faster as I saw a magical beast of a size I had never seen before. Scarlet's only weapon, by the looks of it, is its mouth with fangs and the thorns on the body surface, of course. Hundreds of uneven fangs sprouted from a huge circular mouth at the tip of Scarlet's head, which also held Jemba's hard shell firmly. Don't get caught by its mouth. It will be bad. I am going to use, sore, so don't fall off. Karina and Dagora, you're going to turn and aim at the torso part. I'll attack the mouth myself, so don't go near the mouth. All right. Let's go, Griff. Grr. Karina pumped the B-rank bird's head she was riding on, and the B-rank bird accelerated all at once. They attacked Scarlet Torso with their full power attacks while flying in circles around it. Okay, the rest of us will go for the head. Cecile, check what its weak attribute is. We'll match the time of our extra skills this time. I lifted the ban on extra skills. I had always preached to my friends that the best time to use extra skill was when they were immensely effective. We'll get them all back here. 
I recalled the Birang spirits I had sent to scout the Rocky Mountains. Even if they were far away from me, I could still order them. I was using sharing on them. My plan was to defeat Scarlet by an all-out attack, assuming that Scarlet's physical strength was quite high due to its gigantic size. Huh. Alan, it just recovers whatever we do. Oh, what the heck? It's not working at all. Karina slashed at Scarlet's torso and managed to cut it, but the wound started regenerating at a rapid pace and in no time it was completely healed. The same was happening to Degora's attacks as well. I see. But the attack itself seems to be getting through, so keep going. Again, don't let Scarlet catch you. It's strange. It has almost no endurance. Does its regeneration compensate for its lack of endurance? Even magical beasts had status. It was possible for magical beasts in the same rank to have higher or lower endurance. While watching Karina and Degora's attacks, I found that Scarlet's endurance was very low for a magical beast called S rank and almost none at all. I presumed that it abandoned its endurance for its regeneration ability. Hey, Alan. This guy doesn't have any resistance. Like no resistance at all to magic as well as physical attacks? Yeah, it looks like it, Cecile. It is probably not resistant to attacks of any attributes. Its endurance is also very low. On top of that, it is the type of magical beast that fights with its bulk and recovery speed. That's rare. Scarlet didn't show any sign of weakening even though its torso was being attacked by my friends whose level was approaching the level cap. It had wounds all over its torso but they were healing at a rapid rate. This is no time to be impressed. What's the plan, Alan? That's right. Karina, use, limit break. I want everyone except Cecile and Sophie to activate your extra skills while Karina attacks. Got it. Karina activated her extra skill, Limit Break. She used the awakening skill of B-rank birds, Soar, to slash at Scarlet's torso with all her might. My friends began an all-out assault on Scarlet, who sprayed more blood and bodily fluids than ever before. I decided to use magic stones generously that time and continued to add B-rank spirits and B-rank dragons to attack, focusing on their awakening skills. Okay, the rate at which we are dealing damage is higher than its regeneration speed. We just need one more push. I had also battled enemies with such ability recovery in my previous life. To defeat an enemy who healed naturally, one must inflict more damage on it than it could heal. I called out to Cecile just as Karina's extra skills time was about to run out. Cecile. Use small meteorite and smash its head. Understood. I'll take care of it. Cecile's body began to glow like a shimmer as she used her extra skill, small meteorite, while attacking with magic. Karina, Dogora. Get away from there. Small meteorite is coming. Okay. Let's go. Small meteorite. Dogora, who again tried to use his extra skill and was unable to, reluctantly left, and a meteorite fell from the sky at the same time. I didn't know what the logic behind it was as we were supposed to be in a dungeon with a ceiling, but instead of destroying the ceiling, a mass of red-hot rock several dozen meters in diameter suddenly appeared from near the ceiling and rained down. I had already tested whether Cecile's small meteorite worked in dungeons or not back when we were in Academy City. A meteorite crashed into Scarlet's lifted head, crushing it. Scarlet's head was crushed by the meteorite while its bodily fluids boiled, and its powerless torso slammed to the ground in a cloud of dust. We did it! Damn, if we can't finish it off in one hit, it can recover. I looked at my grimoire to check if we had defeated Scarlet, but the logs in the grimoire didn't mention anything. Since the logs didn't mention anything, I was confident that Scarlet hadn't been defeated. No, not yet. We haven't defeated it yet. Sophie, use Spirit King's Blessing. 
I asked Sophie to use Spirit King's blessing as it had the effect of restoring extra skill. I was correct or Grimoire was. Scarlet moved. Scarlet's body, battered by Karina and everyone else's attacks and Cecile's small meteorite, was recovering. Even its crushed head was completely regenerating. Cecile, who had immense confidence in her small meteorite, which had played an active role in the battle against the demon General Razel, showed a look of despair. No, the fight is not over yet. We're back to square one. Our fight with the horrifying figure of Scarlet continued further. After tens of minutes passed. No, we don't have enough damage output to defeat this thing. Right. I concluded that we couldn't defeat Scarlet. But that time, unlike Bibi, we performed better as there wasn't a match threat to any of our lives. However, Scarlet's recovery rate exceeded our damage output. I persisted with the hope that its recovery rate might weaken, but I did not see any decline in the recovery rate at all. Everyone except Dogora had already finished activating their second extra skill, and its recovery rate was much faster with the reduced power of our attacks. Because of that, Scarlet was basically unscathed. We need more firepower to take this guy down. We can't defeat it as we are now. We need to get stronger. Let's retreat for now. Yeah. My words stopped Karina and Dogora from attacking as well. Scarlet's speed of movement was not great, so we escaped with time to spare. After some distance, Scarlet stopped chasing us and dived head first into the sand again. Thus, the battle with the third floor's S rank floor boss Scarlet, the sandworm ended in Alan and his friends' retreat. Chapter 246 Bar 1 Hey! Stop glaring at me! It's okay! We've got everything here. No, I'm not glaring at you. Kiel couldn't hide his confusion as I looked at him. I'm glad you're happy. Merle. Now you have everything, right? Uh-huh. When Cecile ignored the exchange between me and Kiel and approached Merle, Merle replied awkwardly. At that time, the hidden cube quickly disappeared. My friends and I were in a large hole in a rocky mountain on the third floor. For the last twenty days or so, we searched for magical beasts, treasure chests, and hidden cubes on the third floor. We got four basic stone slabs required for a golem but the last one, for the right hand, did not appear for a long time. We kept looking for the stone slabs from the treasure chests and hidden cubes, but could not find it as we kept getting other parts. I was the one making the exchanges with the hidden cube for the past t20 days, but we couldn't find the right arm stone slab. Kiel wanted to do it too, so I left the task to him, and in just one try, we got what we wanted. Damn. It's always like this. It always takes me so long to gather the equipment. I remembered it always taking me a long time to find the right equipment or material that I wanted in games in my previous life, especially when there was an element of luck involved. We've got a basic golem, but what do we do now? We can't keep Master Helmios waiting. In an attempt to change my depressed mood, Sophie asked me about our future plans. We were going to join Helmios. We had been in the dungeon for about 20 days, and I was told that Helmios was coming to the S-Class dungeon since the Giamut Empire had finished celebrating their victory in the war. It was already two months after the war was over that the celebrations ended. We didn't spend all of our time on the third floor for the past 20 days. I went to the Adventurers Guild once every five days with 1,000 gold coins to collect the 100,000 Dirank Magic Stones. In addition, we found many Hyrakane and Mithril weapons and armors in the dungeon that we didn't need and had to sell. My inventory couldn't store large items, so some of the contents of the treasure chest had become luggage. Once I got the magic stones, I needed time to use Fast Summon and turn them into Mana Seed S. We stayed in the dungeon for three and a half days out of five to allow time for such packing, trading at the Adventurer's Guild, and rest for my friends. We stayed four days and three nights in the dungeon and the rest one and a half days were our off time. 
My friends helped me collect manna seed s that I was producing in a room, which had been changed to a vegetable garden. We were all free to spend our time in the city on the first floor of the S-class dungeon, as we saw fit. In the evening, Merle always insisted on going out to a nearby restaurant for drinks. When Merle finally got to drink after returning from the dungeon after three days, she looked like someone who had gotten water after being stranded on desert. The rest of us wondered if the dwarves would die if they didn't get to drink alcohol. Note that there was alcohol in my inventory for Merle, but I had banned it in the dungeon. While inside the dungeon, Merle had to operate as an abandoned gamer. And abandoned gamers weren't allowed to drink alcohol inside the dungeon. Translators note, here, inside the dungeon means on the second floor and onwards. After all, the city they are staying in is also inside the dungeon. It's almost noon. Let's leave it at that for today and check the golem the next time we enter the dungeon. Is that okay with you, Merle? Yeah. Of course. Thank you all. What? Don't cry. Merle, are you okay? Are you hungry? I am Fugu. Hey, Karina. Oh. You see the geometric symbols start to glow when you fit all the stone slabs in the magic board. I was very happy as after 20 days, we were finally able to collect all the basic stone slabs of an iron golem. Merle clutched the magic board with half of the dents filled in and began to cry. The magic board, that Merle was wearing around her neck like an identity card for elementary schoolers, responded to her hand. The magic board had geometric symbols floating on it, and it looked like a golem was about to emerge at any moment. Such an emotional scene was spoiled by Karina, who was hungry. After sentencing Karina to a cheek snatching, we exited the hole and moved to the first floor from the square in the center of the third floor. Why aren't we going to the Adventurer's Guild directly? When I started heading for our base instead of the Adventurer's Guild just outside the temple, Cecile asked me why I was not going to the Adventurer's Guild where we were supposed to meet up with Helmios. No, we have quite a bit of luggage on our hands right now. We'll put them back and then go. I replied, clutching an adamantite bow that we had gotten from a treasure chest. We reached our base after a ten-minute walk and left our luggage there. Hey, just back from the dungeon? You're late. Hum? Eh? Huh? What does this mean? I was talking with Helmios who we were supposed to meet up at the Adventurer's Guild around noon that day in the base. Since we were going to attack the same dungeon, I thought it would be a good idea to team up. A large amount of goods was being carried into our base by hired dwarven contractors. Huh? Helmios, you didn't get permission for this? No, well. Sylvia. I just thought I'd surprise them. My friends and I were noticed by Sylvia, Helmios companion and a master swordsman. Um, are you saying that you will be staying in our base as well? Yes. But not just me, but my entire party, sacred. Any problems? Okay, but I had it locked up tight, too. Also, Mr. Doberg is here. My gaze fell on a thinly clad, navel-showing female thief. Apparently, the female thief unlocked the lock of the base with her skill. And nearly a dozen of Helmio's companions, including the obviously competent master swordsman Doberg, were watching the exchange between Helmio's and me. The somewhat guilty look on their face was surely due to Helmio's bad side. I couldn't help but think that their expression indicated that there had been such instances before. I see, let the dwarves finish moving. Shall we talk somewhere else? Let's make him pay a lot of rent for this. I didn't ask them to leave the base right then and there. I suggested leaving the place to the dwarves, who I thought were movers, and the servants, who I assumed to be under Helmio's command, and go somewhere else to talk. I was also hungry and wanted to eat. I like your idea. I know a place. Let's all go together. Helmio said that he would take us to a good place. Helmio's called out to his companions to go as well. 
I also discussed it with my friends because of the situation and decided to leave our belongings in the basement warehouse of the base and go with Helmios. Look, this is the place. Oh. Yes. When Helmios pointed to a bar, Merle clenched both her fists in front of her chest and exclaimed with emotion. Is it just my imagination or is her response really better than when we found all the basic stone slabs of the golem? Apparently the drinks there were good, as whenever I visited that place later, I would always find dwarves enjoying a drink. The location along the main street near the base might have had some kind of strong magnetic force working through as Merle was stuck there and couldn't move. This is it. I have visited this type of place. I walked into the bar with a mature expression on my face, not giving the impression that I was there for the first time or that I had already been there many times. Welcome. When I opened the door, the owner of the bar greeted me in a loud voice. There are a lot of dwarves here today. Oh, there's Admiral Galera again. I noticed Admiral Galera in his pirate hat doing the cobra twist on the table to the dwarves who seemed to be under his command. This bar was close to the temple and was frequented by many adventurers who commuted to the S-Class dungeon. There were adventurers who were capable of acquiring more than 1,000 gold coins, let alone 100 gold coins in a single raid. There were many such adventurers in the city. In addition, there were a lot more adventurers in the city who were trying to conquer Class C to Class A dungeons around the Tower of Trials in the outer part of the city on the first floor of the Class S dungeon. Admiral Galera spent his days, when he was not in the dungeon, drinking and having a good time with nearly twenty dwarves in that bar. Oh, hey, isn't that black hair? Yeah, maybe so. Let's go call Master Zoo. Ah. Hum? What? A couple of beastmen who were drinking near the entrance at the same time I noticed Admiral Galera seemed to have noticed me. After a few whispered conversations, they paid their bill and left the bar. What's that? Isn't that Admiral Galera? After everyone in our group took seats, they noticed Admiral Galera's noisy group. Ah. Oh, if it isn't the hero of the Central Continent? Hey, you guys, let's go greet him. With that, Admiral Galera jumped down from the table, clutched a wooden mug, and approached Helmios in an impersonal manner with several dwarves in tow. Chapter 247 Bar 2 Do you know him? Because Helmios called out to him, the gruff Admiral Galera came with a wooden mug to the large table where Helmios' party and we were sitting. Yes. Admiral Galera is often in this dungeon. Sometimes we share information, and we often meet each other at meetings of the Five Continents Alliance. I see. Do they have many opportunities to meet each other in their positions? In the midst of the conversation between Helmios and me, Merle was frantically ordering from the waiter, a dwarf. The last time I met Admiral Galera for the first time, he was acting like I'm a superior officer who has been a great help to you. And Rosen, the spirit god, who had landed at the table from Sophie's shoulder, folded his arms as he looked at the menu and mumbled about what he was going to have. It's always Hakama anyway. I have a whole bunch of freshly made things in my inventory, don't. Hakama, a specialty of the Baki's empire, was a steamed, chewy bread. Spirit god Rosen loved it, which ended up me having a bunch of it in my inventory. Is the hero of the Central Continent here to conquer the dungeon? Looking at Admiral Galera, I remembered a scene of my previous life where I was forced to go to an employee drinking party when I wanted to play games back at my home and got tangled up with an old man sitting next to me. I'm sure you are here for the same reason, Admiral Galera. Have you been to the dungeon yet? Oh, yeah. The war is over. It's time to conquer the dungeon. Those faces. So the Baki's empire has moved to capture it? While conversing with Admiral Galera, the hero Helmios looked at the table where the dwarves were sitting when Admiral Galera arrived. I guess. It seems that the Beast Kingdom is serious. We can't lag behind. I'm having a hard time serving the emperor who's so obstinate. Oh. 
unhhh. As Admiral Galera was about to speak ill of the Emperor of the Baki's Empire again, the dwarfs who came with him his mouth and strangled him with their hand and carried him to the table where he had originally come from. Mr. Helmios. What do you mean the Baki's Empire is serious? Hum? Oh, all the dwarves at that table are magic rock generals, except for Admiral Galera. Seriously? Admiral Galera, a magic rock king, is leading a group of magic rock generals. Aren't they a force that can be called the total strength of the Baki's Empire? The Bakius Empire really is serious. There were twenty dwarves, including Admiral Galera, at that table. Helmios told me that with the exception of Admiral Galera, everyone there had a one in ten million talent of magic rock general. I first met and learned about Admiral Galera from Merle when we met twenty days ago. Admiral Galera was the strongest dwarf of the Bakius Empire as he was the only one with magic rock king talent in the Bakis Empire. I like it. I kind of miss it. I felt nostalgic for such a situation as memories of my previous life came back to me. Oh. Alan, the Holy Knight, was also a golem user. Whoa. Why? No, it's nothing. The food is here, so let's eat. Cecile, sitting next to me, was about to say something unnecessary, so I covered her mouth. In my previous life, I had worked to develop my character by hunting in what could basically be called an efficient, frantic way of hunting, but that was not the only way I played the game. For example, I also played with mage-only parties that went out to the hunting grounds, where everyone shoots magic and defeats the enemy while only having paper armor. It was a so-called solo play. Admiral Galara's party, composed entirely of golem users, was surely a combination of offensive and defensive members, so it couldn't be just called a solo party. No, it's nothing. I just thought they were trying to conquer the dungeon with only golem users. So, by the way, how do you challenge the dungeon, Mr. Helmios? Um, we are just here to level up and get good equipment, not to conquer. You are aiming to conquer, right, Alan? We came with that intention. Then you can stay with us at the base, but we will go separated in the dungeon. Yeah, yeah, I guess we will. I was not going to kick out Helmio's party who had already moved to our base. Since the building was large enough to house 30 people, I was planning to make them pay the rent as well. Naturally, their servants were also included in that number. My friends and I were having trouble managing the base anyway. We wanted to concentrate on the dungeon, so there was no one to manage the base. Just thinking about being cooped up in the dungeon for days on end, and then returning to do the housework was making me tired. Well, as long as we don't talk about my summons abilities or my previous life, that's fine. But still, you don't want to conquer the dungeon? Seems like a pretty good party to me. I thought you were here primarily for conquering the dungeon considering your composition. No, no, this dungeon is tough even for our party. Oh, I forgot. Let me introduce you guys. Then, as if remembering, Helmios introduced the names of his companions and their talents. Helmios party consisted of ten people, and apparently everyone but Helmios had three stars talent. Sacred party was led by Helmios the Hero King. Hero King Helmios. Master Swordsman Sylvia and Doberg. One Holy Knight. Two Saints. Two Grand Mages. One Master Archer. One Phantom Thief. All of them are women except Mr. Doberg. Was there a man among the servants? But still, there is only one Holy Knight. I didn't realize that there is only one Holy Knight is a common perception in this world as well. Our party abandoned gamers also introduced ourselves one by one. All parties only had one holy knight, who could tank and also use support magic, and they having more than one in the party didn't have any advantage because their support magic overlapped and they were slightly worse than full-on tanks in terms of defense. I remembered that there were restrictions when forming a party to go hunting together, like how many people of this class in my previous life. 
In the online game I played in my previous life, there could only be one holy knight in a party. Sword King? Is it true that you can change your talent? Yes, it is. While I was deep in my memory, my party also introduced themselves, and finally Doberg responded about Karina's talent. Doberg. Helmios tried to control him, but Doberg stood up. Spirit God Rosen. Hum? What is it? I would like to change my talent too. That's why I am here. Doberg bowed his head deeply and pleaded with Rosen, who was chewing on his hukumen. Hum. Rosen put his hand on his chin and began to think. If you hear that you can become stronger by changing talents, who wouldn't want to change talents? I wonder if Doberg accompanied Helmios just so he could change his talent. I was told that if I could pay the price, you can change my talent. Hum, Doberg. I wonder what you will pay me. Ha <laughs> ha. I am fine if I only get to live for one more year. I will give you all the rest. Would that not be a price? Doberg kept his head down and continued to plead with Rosen, who was sitting cross-legged on the table. Hey, Alan. You don't have to stop him. Everyone was upset except for me and Helmios. Cecile told me to stop. Master Swordsman Doberg said that if he could change his talent, he didn't need to live for more than one year. That's how much power Doberg seemed to want. Master Swordsman Doberg. Yes. I've heard about your way of life from Creator Elmia. I have also heard about how you have left everything behind and are fighting against the demons and the demon generals. Master Elmia is very grateful to you. So, then, will you change my talent? I'm not done talking about it, okay? I'm sorry. I changed Alan's party's talent on my own initiative. The Divine Realm is in a bit of a mess because of that. The Divine Realm values equality for all. So please wait a little. Wait? Yes. Let's just say that we are in the process of making adjustments in the Divine Realm with regard to the talent change. Is that an answer? That's what I'm here for too. It's what I did. Ha ha. I understand. I will be waiting for you. Ha ha ha. The conversation between Doberg and Rosen ended there. Rosen resumed his frantic chewing of the hukuman, his stomach growling. Doberg also began drinking without saying a word. His eyes were closed and his shoulders were shaking. He seemed to have gone somewhere in his own world. Perhaps he felt something strong about changing his talent and gaining more power. I see, so that was the reason why spirit god Rosen followed Sophie. Still, Merle drinks a little too much after. I knew that though Rosen didn't tell me, he had his own reasons for being there. I shifted my gaze to Merle, who had forgotten herself and was drinking. Just as I was about to warn not to drink too much, the door of the bar opened vigorously. Here? Yes, Master Zoo. This way, please. A lion beastman, over two meters tall, entered the store with great vigor, accompanied by some beastmen. Chapter 248 Bar 3 When Master Swordsman Doberg said he wanted to change talent, the spirit god Rosen told him to wait a bit. In the midst of all they, the door to the bar opened with a bang. So which one of them is this Alan? It's him. Hum? Isn't he the wolf beast man we saved before? I recognized the wolf beast man behind the lion beast man who suddenly walked into the bar. He was the wolf beast man named UR who was in the party that was attacked by BB on the second floor. Asked by the lion beast man, UR pointed straight at me. Hum? After looking at me and letting out a sound, the lion beast man came straight at me, shaking his muscular shoulders. Oh! You're not going to do it? Get out of the front. I motioned to the lion beast man. This is Prince Zhu, of the Albahar Beast Kingdom. 
It has been a long time. Helmios seemed to know the lion beast man. Helmios greeted him while seated. M.M. Hero of the Central Continent? I heard you were sent to war, is the war over? Prince, he said. They called him Master Zoo or something. Is this beast man a prince of the beast kingdom? We won the war. Is His Majesty the Beast King alive and well? Helmios responded to the irreverent Prince Zeus Beast with a smile. Hum, he is alive and well just as he was when brought you down to the ground in front of the Emperor of the Jayamut Empire. Hum? Brought him down to the ground? Oh, I'm glad to hear that. It was something of a disturbing conversation, but the Beast Prince... Zo looked towards me. I see that you are with the hero of the Central Continent. So, was it you who saved my people? If it happened about twenty days ago, then yes, it was me. I answered him. I heard you were attacked instead. Did you manage to escape Bibi? Well, yes, I did. What about it? I didn't say whether it was easy or difficult for us to escape from Bibi. You saved the beast men. I have come to thank you on behalf of my brethren. I was told that you were going to demand a reward of some kind. What do you want? Oh! The royal family has come to thank me just because we helped some adventurer? Unlike their irreverent and violent appearance, the royalty of the beast kingdom was more righteous than I thought. Hum! I started thinking seriously. Tell me. Since Prince Zhu received no immediate response, he prompted me to answer. I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. Do you mind if I ask for the reward some time in the future? Ha! Huh. What do you mean? Behind him, the beast man named U.R. began to tremble at my words. I couldn't think of a reward right then and there, so I asked him if I could ask for the reward when I had something in mind later. Well, let's hear why, shall we? I must say that I did not expect royalty of the beast kingdom to reward me. But since I am getting a reward, I would like to ask for your help when I am in more trouble. We are in the middle of trying to conquer the dungeon after all. Conquer? Has the Jayamut Empire finally gotten serious about conquering the dungeon? At the mention of conquering the dungeon, the beast prince so looked at Helmios with a stronger gaze than before. No, we're not. Helmios denied him. Is that so? Well, good. Then come to me when you are in trouble. You can ask any beast man around here where I am. And Helmios, too. Yes. If there is anything you need, Prince Zeus, please contact us. We are together with him. Humph! What do you mean together? Having said that, Beast Prince Zil left the bar with Beast Men in tow. The Beast Men who were inside the bar went out of the bar to see him off. I don't know how Alan can talk to the royalty of any country. Cecile put down the word Holy Knight and gave me a jittery look. Well, he was royalty from another country. There was no reason to be loyal to him. No, you didn't look like you were loyal to your own king either. Kiel recalled my actions in the audience chamber that I had taken to return him to nobility. With such conversation, Karina and Dagora resumed eating, since Beast Prince Zu was gone. Helmio's companions looked at me in amazement, saying that it was just as they had heard. So, what did he mean by brought you to the ground? It sounded to me like you were defeated by a beast man, senior. I think it was the year before I fought against you at the academy. I was supposed to have a match with the current beast king in a meeting of the Five Continents Alliance. What? You fought against the beast king? I asked a question that bothered me about the conversation between Beast Prince Zhu and Helmios. Yes. And I was beaten up without any help. I was so embarrassed at that time. Helmios told me the story of his own defeat with a helter-skelter smile. 
At a meeting of all things, the emperor of the Jayamut Empire made the statement that Helmios, who was always victorious in his battles against the demon king's army, was the world's hero. Honoring one's own hero was a show of one's own national strength. The Baki's empire and the Albahar Beast Kingdom refuted the claim saying that he was only the hero of the central continent and not of the world. The Baki's empire had Admiral Galera. Then, the current Beast King said that there were many that could beat Helmios. The emperor of the Jayamut Empire said that if they doubted Helmios' strength, they could just have a friendly spar, so Helmios and the Beast King fought while the emperors and other heads of states in the Five Continent Alliance watched. After that, the emperor scolded me because I had lost. It was terrible of him, wasn't it? It's terrible to be scolded after a painful, almost one-sided defeat, said Helmios with a laugh. That's strange. Why did the hero lose when royalty could only have one star talent? Hum? Could it be that the rule I had read only applied for humans? I chimed in with I see. And pondered why Helmios lost. Something made me wonder if I was getting closer to the truth of the world after hearing Helmio's story, or even further away from it. The Beast King probably specialized in 1v1 fights. That's right. But, that's not an excuse, I just lost. I had no way of winning. I see, the Beast King specialized in agility. But still, he was faster than a hero? Hey, Alan. What do you mean? I think that the Beast King's status is more specialized in fighting against individuals and his agility is higher than his other statuses. In comparison, Mr. Helmios has an average status in all fields. If you don't hit him, you won't win. It's common knowledge that heroes are balanced types and poor in dexterity. But still, that means the Baki's empire has someone strong enough to defeat him too. It's probably something like that. Alan, you seem to have appraisal skills. I predicted that Admiral Galera of the Baki's Empire was as powerful as Helmio's. That would be including the strength of the Golem, but he was probably not the strongest in the Baki's Empire. As I, who was not present at the time of the match, analyzed Helmio's fight, everyone's eyes were focused on me. At least unlike the Baki's Empire and the Beast Kingdom, everyone here knew what I had done in the war in Rosenheim a few months ago. Some of Helmio's companions looked at me with threatening eyes, even though they looked a year younger than Helmio's. I'm also curious about your last words. It sounded something like, we will help you with the Beast Prince Zoo. Oh, hum. The hero seemed to hesitate if he should speak. What? Well, if it's something you don't want to say, I won't force you to. Or is it the political intricacies of the Jayamut Empire? No, I don't. I'm indebted to you, Alan. And you are from the Ladash Kingdom, so I guess I should tell you. I'm not very good at drawing the line between what's right and wrong. Helmios said as he looked at Master Swordsman Sylvia, who nodded lightly. You should talk to Mr. Alan. Maybe he can help. I'm not saying I will help, but how can you be so sure? Sylvia urged Helmios to say it. It is said that if the Beast King of the Albahar Beast Kingdom should fall, the Beast Kingdom will invade the Central Continent. What? What are you saying, Mr. Helmios? What about the Five Continents Alliance? I raised my voice to say what he meant. Of course. I am sure that the Crown Prince Beck, who is supposed to be the next Beast King, will invade. He will take advantage of the Demon King's army and invade. Why though? Cecile choked up and looked at Helmio's companions, also from the Jayamut Empire, to see if Helmio's story was true, but no one refuted him. It seemed to be an open and shut fact. I've never heard of anything like that at the Academy, but have they ever invaded in the past? I don't think they have after the Demon King's army invaded. But it has been 1,000 years since the Beast Kingdom became independent. I'm told that the Beast Kingdom has invaded the Central Continent many times during that time. The Beast Men were severely discriminated against and treated by the Jayamut Empire. 
they had been persecuted and the accumulated bitterness of that time was still alive even after 1,000 years. Apparently, the beast king of the time then issued an order to gather a large army and invade the central continent to take retribution. That's what you meant when you said you were from the Ladash kingdom. Huh? Cecile did not understand. That's what I mean. If they attack us, I think the lower third of the central continent will be taken. We will then have to fight a two-pronged battle with the demon king's army. Oh, I get it. That's how it is. That's why such a weak state has continued to exist next to the empire. I had one long-held question answered. What? Alan, what did you find out? Maybe the Ladash Kingdom has existed for the last thousand years as a defensive wall to protect the imperial citizens when they are attacked by the Beast Kingdom. The Ladash Kingdom was one of the southern countries on the central continent. About two-thirds of the northern part of the central continent belonged to the Jayamut Empire. The Jayamut Empire had the small Ladash Kingdom as a defensive wall to protect itself. When the Beast Kingdom attacked, they could use the time while Ladash Kingdom would be under attack to mobilize their own forces. Well, then, Mr. Helmios. If the Beast Prince Zu becomes the next Beast King, will it be averted? That's right. If Beast Prince Zu becomes the next Beast King, it will be good for the Jayamut Empire. Some people are also suggesting the Warrior Princess, but I'm just hoping that the current Crown Prince Beck doesn't become the Beast King. He even came to thank me when I saved just one or two beast men. The Jayamut Empire seemed to be pushing for the Beast Prince so to be the Beast King and considered the Crown Prince Beck to be dangerous. Warrior Princess? I'm told that there is a Beast Princess who is the youngest child of the current Beast King, but has a great personality and fighting skills. I have never met her. Come to think of it, I haven't heard much about her lately. It seemed that even with his position as the hero, he was not allowed to enter the Beast Kingdom. And it was unknown if the Beast Princess, known as the Warrior Princess, was even alive. This world is not made up of only peaceful, friendly nations. Like it is the case with the Elves and Dark Elves. It reminded me about the Demon General Razel, who was a Dark Elf. Alan learned that this world with the Demon King was quite chaotic. Chapter 249 Merle's Golem My friends and I heard about the relationship between the Beast Kingdom and the Central Continent for the first time. Since there wasn't anything that I could do, I just hoped that Beast Prince Zhu, who seemed to get along well with the Central Continent, would become the next Beast King. It seemed that the Jayamut Empire was negotiating for their stability. The Beast Kingdom became independent from the Empire 1,000 years ago, but both the Jayamut Empire and the Beast Kingdom of Arbahal had coexisted since then. I hoped that they would talk it over and find a way to resolve the issue. I believed that there was much that could be done to prevent the worst from happening. However, if the Beast Kingdom were to attack from the south of the Central Continent, I would have no choice but to stop fighting against the Demon King's army. According to Helmios, if the Beast Kingdom invaded, millions of Beast Men would be part of it. Although they were part of the Five Continents Alliance, the Beast Kingdom was a potential threat to the Central Continental. So, I concluded that the Demon King's army wasn't going to attack the Southern Continents. If the Beast Kingdom ever invaded, even if the whole Beast Man race were to go extinct, I was determined to protect the village and country where my family lived. No matter how much blood is spilled, I will protect the Ladash Kingdom. Hope things won't come to that. My words were so matter-of-fact that Helmio's companions gulped, knowing that my friends and I had defeated the majority of the ten million of the Demon King's army. Our meeting with Helmio's party ended shortly after that. Helmios asked me how often we were in the dungeon, and when I told him that we spent three and a half days in the dungeon at once, he said that his party would match our pace. The three-story building we were staying at had the same layout as our base in the Academy City, with men's rooms on the second floor and women's rooms on the third floor, but the rooms on the third floor were no longer sufficient. Since Helmio's party was almost a harem, we decided to use part of the second floor for women as well. 
Helmio's party was going to work mainly on the fourth floor of the dungeon as valuable weapons and armors were available there. In addition, they wanted to raise Helmio's level and skill levels, who had recently become Hero King. Okay, well, let's see if you can get the Iron Golem to descend. Yeah. My friends and I were in the square of the third floor. The square was a large safe zone where no magical beasts could come, making it ideal for experimenting with the golem. With the rest of us behind her, Merle gripped the magic board. The magic board, clenched with both hands, had geometric symbols floating on its surface. The magic board looks so cool. Is the golem finally descending? At the unusual reaction of the magic board, Kiel gripped his staff and braced himself. Then, taking one big breath, Merle exclaimed. Tam Tam descend! A huge magic circle with geometric symbols arranged in a circle was laid out in front of Merle. Then, as if popping out of a magic circle, a single golem emerged from it. A ten-meter-long iron body stood erect and immobile on the ground. Wow! How does this thing work? It can't move it unless I'm on it. A golem couldn't move by itself, just like puppets. It wouldn't move unless the golem user, the operator, was inside it. Merle held up the magic board to the iron golem that appeared. Then, from the crystal-like part of its chest, light emanated from the golem to illuminate Merle with a flashlight that responded to the magic board. Merle was sucked into the golem. That's amazing. It's moving. Oh. It moved. As Dogora was mouthing off about what kind of logic would allow Merle to fit inside the crystal, the golem began to move slowly. It was being piloted by Merle. The golem tried walking, moving a little faster, attacking, and so on in the square, and it seemed to be able to move freely. There would be no problems fighting against the magical beasts with those movements. Merle came out of the golem after some time. Merle! That's great! He he! Merle looked somewhat embarrassed as Karina praised her. I see. So this is the performance of this golem. The magic board could fit up to ten stone slabs. And on the flat back side of the magic board, the performance of the golem was indicated. Name, Tam Tam. Pilot, Merle. Class, Iron. Strength, 1500 plus 900. Mana, 1500 plus 900. Attack, 1500. Endurance, 1500 plus 900. Agility, 1500. Intelligence, 1500 plus 900. Luck, 1500. Is the increase in strength, mana, and endurance the result of Merle's alloy skill? If the golem is affected by the pilot's skills then. I took a serious look at the magic board around Merle's neck. My grimoire showed me the status of my friends, but it didn't show me the status of Merle's golem. However, it was displayed on the back of the magic board of the pilot. Just as Helmios was able to see my status with his appraisal, I expected that this world could quantify the status with skills due to some talents and the magic boards. And since the status increase was 900, I expected the increase to be by 180 when Merle's alloy reached level 2. The increase in status due to the number of stars in the pilot's talent affected the status of the golem. Well, try to fit the strengthening slab we got. Yes. While trying to find five basic stone slabs, we also got three strengthening slabs from treasure chests and hidden cubes. The size of the strengthening slab was the same as that of the basic slabs, so a maximum of five could be fitted on the magic board. I also learned from Merle that the size of the stone slabs differed for different special slabs. The size seemed to depend on the effect the stone slab had. The more special the effect, the larger the stone slab was, filling the space of the magic board, which could only fit a maximum of 10. Basic Stone Slab 1 Strengthening Stone Slab 1 Giant Stone Slab 2 Translators Note Increase Size of the Golem 
Gigantic Stone Slab 3, TLN, increases more than the above one, couldn't think of any names. The size of the movement slab 3. Other special slabs 5. I recognized that strengthening Merle's golem was very important if we wanted to conquer the dungeon. We had strengthening stone slabs that increased strength, attack, and agility, so we put all three of them on. Then, the golem's status increased by 2000 EA chapter. The strengthening stone slabs of the iron class seem to be consistent with an increase of 2000 per slab. If I want to protect it, can I put a stone plate for strength and endurance? If I want to protect myself, I can put on a stone plate for strength and durability? But now Merle's skill level is going up. Merle couldn't raise her skill levels without a golem. Then, Merle. Now for the real battle. Yes. After some understanding of the golem's power, we moved towards a rocky mountain. We already had a good idea of the rocky mountains where the magical beasts appeared. Merle was in her iron golem with Karina and Dagora in front of the big hole in the rocky mountain while the rest of us were on Birank birds. As usual, scorpion magical beasts started pouring out of the hole. As Karina and Dagora braced themselves, the iron golem swung its arm. Megaton Punch! Merle activated her rocket arm skill. An iron arm reached out and crushed a scorpion magical beast. Ho ho ho, is it connected to the golem by some kind of string? While the skill was called Rocket Arm, I didn't have to find a new arm every time Merle used the skill, so I thought that Megaton Punch was a better name for the attack than Rocket Punch after. Note that the option of an Iron Punch was excluded from the beginning. I didn't think Mithril Punch was a good name for an attack, since we were planning for Merle to upgrade to a Mithril Golem on the next floor. We wiped out the magical beasts that came out of the hole with relative ease. Merle, you did it. It's going to help us out a lot when we change our talents. Cecile praised Merle. In another month, everyone except Merle and me will have reached their full skill level and changed talents. Thanks to Merle's golem, we could get by with the lower status in the third floor that only had A-rank magical beasts as floor bosses. Yes, but A-rank magical beasts will still be hard to. Merle's status won't be enough to defeat a defense-oriented A-rank magical beast. Merle's iron golem had an attack of 3,500. We still have to collect some stone slabs. You can handle the B-ranks and leave the A-ranks to Karina and Dagora. Yes, Merle. You can leave them to me. Karina puffed out her and Merle smiled in return. In this way, Merle got a golem and the dungeon raid continued. Chapter 250 Changing Talents 2 After one month since Merle first piloted her golem, we had obtained a strengthening stone slab and one that increased its size. The golem Tam Tam was getting stronger and stronger. Mr. Helmios, aren't you going to the dungeon today? I mean, Rosetta. Please don't get too attached. There's an empty seat over there. Don't touch me. Don't say that. We are friends. Yes, Alan. You shouldn't talk like that to your seniors. We were on the ground floor of the base, which we were sharing with Helmio's party. All members of both parties were there. Thanks to that, the group was quite large, about 20 people, but our base was made to accommodate a party of 30 adventurers, so it was not a problem. In addition, since we had decided to split the rent where Helmio's party paid 20 gold coins and we paid 10. Thanks to Helmio's servants who had furnished this once empty base, the tables and sofas that suited a noble's mansion filled our base. Rosetta, a thief was sitting next to me on the sofa. The woman in the navel girdle clothes was trying to get in my way, to see what I liked. I asked her how she joined the Helmios party as she often tangled with me over drinks at the base. Apparently, Rosetta was the head of a gang of thieves in the imperial capital of the Jayamut Empire. She was caught and about to be executed, but was released on the condition that she become Helmios party member. She then wanted to steal Helmio's heart. 
My respect for Helmios went up a bit as I wondered if that was a way to get a rare three-star thief type to join him. For various reasons, Helmios had eight women around twenty years old in his party. Rosetta, the thief, nimbly places her hand on my shoulder. I was unresponsive no matter what she did, which seemed to amuse her. A sigh escaped my mouth. Oh! Then Cecile, who was sitting next to me, silently brushes off Rosetta's hand and glares at her, with a murderous gaze. That made Rosetta more excited. Apparently, she enjoyed teasing Cecile. In the midst of all that, Rosen, the spirit god in his flying squirrel form, riding on Sophie's shoulder, floated in the air and looked towards me. That day, spirit god Rosen was going to change my friend's talents. We took a day off because I wanted to talk about how we were going to fight with their new talents. You've all reached your limit of growth. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes. Please change everyone's talent who have reached the level caps. I will start now. Ha <laughs> ha. I can finally change talent. The spirit god Rosen did his usual hip-swinging dance as he proceeded with changing talents, while master swordsman Doberg looked on with tears in his eyes. Perhaps it was a scene he had dreamed about for decades. Not only Doberg, but all of Helmio's companions were looking at my friends who were having their talents changed with wide eyes. Some had more choices in their talents, but they chose their talents with our party composition and efficiency in mind. Then, everyone's talent change was done. Name, Karina. Age, 14. Talent, Sword Emperor. Level, 1. Strength, 1790. Magic, 770. Attack, 1790. Endurance, 1608. Agility, 1150. Intelligence, 775. Luck, 1095. Skills, Sword Emperor 1, Slash 1, Swordsmanship, 6. Extra Skill, Limit Break. Experience, 0 out of 10. Skill Level. Sword Emperor, 1. Slash, 1. Skill Experience. Slash, 0 out of 10. Name, Dogora. Age, 14. Talent, Barbarian General. Level, 1. Strength, 1098. Magic, 651. Attack, 1615. Endurance, 817. Agility, 683. Intelligence, 504. Luck, 727. Skill, Barbarian General 1, Full Body 1, Axemanship 6, Shield Art 2. Extra, Body and Soul. Experience, 0 out of 10. Skill Level. Barbarian General 1. Full Body 1. Skill Experience. Full Body, 0 out of 10. Name, Cecile Granvel. Age, 14. Talent, Arc Homage. Level, 1. Strength, 995. Magic, 1614. Attack, 578. Endurance, 624. Agility, 1022. Intelligence, 1778. Luck, 1007. Skills, Archmage 1, Fire Magic 1, Kumite 4. Extra Skill, Small Meteorite. Experience, 0 out of 10. Skill Level. Archmage, 1. Fire Magic, 1. Skill Experience. Fire Magic, 0 out of 10. Name, Kiel von Carnell. Age, 14. Talent, Saint. Level, 1. Strength, 583. Magic, 1120. Attack, 447. Endurance, 623. 
Agility, 712. Intelligence, 979. Luck, 895. Skills, Saint 1, Recovery Magic 1, Swordsmanship 3. Extra Skill, God Drop. Experience, 0 out of 10. Skill Level. Saint, 1. Recovery Magic, 1. Skill Experience. Recovery Magic, 0 out of 10. Name, Sophiaron. Age, 49. Blessing, Spirit God. Talent, Spirit Mage. Level, 1. Strength, 712. Magic, 1231. Attack, 504. Endurance, 489. Agility, 713. Intelligence, 1406. Luck, 594. Skill, Spirit Mage 1, Fire Spirit Magic 1. Extra, Great Spirit Manifestation. Experience, 0 out of 10. Skill Level. Spirit Mage, 1. Fire Spirit Magic, 1. Skill Experience. Fire Spirit Magic, 0 out of 10. Name, Fermar. Age, 68. Talent, Master Archer. Level, 1. Strength, 982. Magic, 535. Attack, 850. Endurance, 846. Agility, 543. Intelligence, 360. Luck, 582. Skill, Master Archery 1, Farsight 1, Archery 6. Extra, Arrow of Light. Experience, 0 out of 10. Skill Level. Master Archery, 1. Farsight, 1. Skill Experience. Farsight, 0 out of 10. I noted down my friend's stats and their changed talents. Karina equals Master Swordsman 3 stars equals Sword King 4 stars equals Sword Emperor 5 stars. Cecile equals Mage 2 stars equals Grand Mage 3 stars equals Archmage 4 stars. Dogora equals Axe Knight 1 star Barbarian 2 stars Barbarian General 3 stars. Keel equals Priest 1 star equals Bishop 2 stars equals Saint 3 stars. Sophie equals Spirit Wielder 1 star Spirit Magician 2 stars Spirit Mage 3 stars. Fermar equals Bowman 1 star equals Archer 2 stars equals Master Archer 3 stars. Translator's note, I am really surprised that Fermar talent was just 1 star considering that he is the princess bodyguard. Also, I still think that somewhere in the Academy arc it was mentioned that he had a 2 star talent. I am changing one star of the archer line to Bowman just so in the war we can make sense that there were two star archers. If you have anything you want to talk about, let's discuss in Discord. Patreon channel. That's it. Dogora is a barbarian general? I thought his extra skill will disappear after his talent change. After all, he hasn't even used it once as a barbarian. Is he also in hell mode since he can't use his extra skill? I was being sarcastic when I said that. Dogora didn't refute anything. I was convinced that we would be a lot more stronger if Dogora were able to use his extra skill whenever he wanted. I had been asking Helmio's tips on how Dogora could use his extra skill, but I hadn't gotten any useful information out of him. Thank you, by the way. I hope everyone saw it. Now there's hope for mankind. As I recorded the results of the talent change, Helmios began to talk. No, it's nothing to hide. If the information that Spirit God Rosen was preparing to enable everyone to change talents, then the world would know that their talents could be changed. I believed that there was no longer any need to hide it. In addition, although I lived with Helmios and his companion, I had not shown them how I made, Blessing of Heaven, S, and, Mana Seed, S. 
If they ever asked me what I did in my room on my days off, I wouldn't answer truthfully. I just simply replied with, I'm resting. I didn't believe that it was necessary to tell them all of our abilities. But don't forget about my request. I know. Even if you didn't show me this process, I'd have still made an introduction. I had one request for Helmios. That was the processing of Oracalcum. We could find Oracalcum on the fourth floor. However, Helmios told me that the Oracalcum on the fourth floor was just a jump of metal and not made into weapons and armors. According to Helmios, Digragni didn't have the power to process Oracalcum, a divine ore, into weapons and armor. It seemed that the processing required the help of Freya, the god of fire. The Oracalcum rarely obtained on the fourth floor were always found in unprocessed state. So I asked Helmios to introduce me to the best and most famous master blacksmith of this Bakis empire. He told me that a grumpy dwarven blacksmith, who didn't accept visitors at first glance, could process the Oracalcum into swords, shields, and armor. Also, bring it the next time we go to the dungeon. Yes, Master Allen. I will do my best. Master Allen, I alone am enough, Lady Sophiaron should just focus on the spirits first. For Mar, we don't have much time. Let's try both at once first, and if it's too tough, we can just focus on the spirits. Sophie was upset, so Fermar followed up. But I did not change my mind. Sophie became a spirit mage. It was a talent that manifested spirits and made them fight. I had given Sophie an adamantite bow we had recovered from a treasure chest less than two months ago. I had kept it at the base without selling it, thinking I would give it to Sophie when she changed talents. I had seen spirit mage Gataruga fight in the Rosenheim War, but he had a bow. I asked Sophie if she could use the bow in conjunction with her spirits, after she became a spirit mage, she told me that once she got used to communicating with the spirits, there would be no problem. That is why I had given Sophie two tasks, mastering her bow skills and communicating with the spirits. With an adamantite bow, Sophie could defeat B-rank magical beasts instantly, and if her attack were to be increased with a ring, even A-rank magical beasts could be injured. I strongly persuaded Sophie to learn it for her future efficiency. We'll try the fourth floor after we grind on the third floor for another month or so. I began to talk about our future plans. Abandoned gamers, huh? As she listened to this, Rosetta, the thief who had previously heard the meaning of the party name Abandoned Gamers, in which Alan was the leader, looked at the current situation and was somewhat convinced. Chapter 251 Reason Everyone in the party except for Merle and I successfully changed talents for the second time. They were all reduced to level 1, but even regular magical beasts that were not floor bosses could raise their level without problems in the third floor. I decided to go to the fourth floor of the dungeon when my friends reached level 50, which would require a month or so of grinding. As a result of continuously exchanging our metals for stone slabs with the hidden cubes, we did not have that many iron metals, but the third floor of the dungeon had a fair share of hurricane weapons and armor. Selling the weapons and armor we found would often net us profit that often exceeded 10,000 gold coins in a single dungeon attack, so we decided that it was faster just to buy metals. Now that I had more gold coins to spare, I negotiated with the Adventurer's Guild to see if I could buy magic stones other than ear inks. After negotiations, they agreed to let me buy 1,000 gold coins worth of magic stones of other ranks as well. I wanted to increase the number of D-rank and C-rank magic stones in my inventory through these purchases. The Adventurer's Guild took a 10% fee, the same as Academy City's Guild. I didn't buy any B-rank magic stones as the S-class dungeon was filled with B-rank magical beasts and I had plenty of them in my inventory. Hey, hey, hey! I'm eating now. Please be quiet. A-U-A-U. -A -U. I'm getting used to it. Is that right? As everyone was having breakfast, Sophie, sitting in a chair, picked up something from her feet, laid it on her lap and hugged it. It was bright red and looked like a salamander, and the tip of its tail was burning like a candle. 
I wondered why the fire at the tip of its tail didn't burn any furniture as if it was just for appearance's sake. Maybe the salamander is hungry too? Karina guessed while stabbing a piece of meat with her fork. No, no, spirits don't need to eat. If they are hungry, I simply have to offer my mana. Though the spirit god eats normally. Sophie was hugging a salamander, an infant fire spirit who had crawled up to her. Our. The dull-eyed salamander squealed in delight and flapped his hands in the air. The situation was a result of my orders. I had learned from Spirit Major Gataruga in Rosenheim that spirits had a will and didn't always do what the spirit user wanted them to do in battle. Translator's note, spirit user encomaps is any talent that uses spirit just like how golem user encomposes any who uses a golem. He also said that the longer a spirit and the spirit user are in contact with each other, the higher their affinity gets and the more willing the spirits are to obey the spirit user's instructions. When I heard that Sophie was slowly and steadily getting to know the spirits, I thought that slow was not good enough. So, I instructed Sophie to keep the spirit out to the limit at all times. Thanks to that, the infant fire spirit salamander, which looked like a bright red salamander, stayed by Sophie's side during meals and when she slept, until she emptied her mana. It probably has low, intelligence, as it was squealing and repeatedly wrapping itself around Sophie, rubbing her face, etc. The logic is totally different depending on the summons, golems, and the spirits. Having lived as a summoner for about 14 years, I was interested in similar techniques for many years. I had both golem user and spirit user as friends and had analyzed the characteristics of each and noticed that they differed from a summoner in many ways. Summoner required mana and magic stones to summon. A B-rank dragon required over 3,000 mana and 29 B-rank magic stones. It took a lot of mana and magic stones just to summon one B-rank dragon, but no mana was needed to descend an iron golem or manifest a fire spirit salamander. A golem user could descend his her golem as many times as they wanted as long as they had the required number of stone slabs in the magic board. A spirit user didn't need mana, magic stones, or anything else to manifest a spirit. That was a major advantage for golem users and spirit users, but there was also a disadvantage. Golems and spirits consumed the user's mana just by existing. Both the golem and the spirits had mana requirements and continued to consume the golem users and spirit users just by being existing. Looking at the Merle fight, I found out that a golem user with about 3,000 mana wouldn't be able to fight for more than an hour in a skilled fight. It seemed that spirit users were similar and required the same degree of mana to make the manifested spirit fight. So the Baki's empire desperately needs mana seed s. I recalled that foreign minister Nakakai desperately sought mana seed s. It took an enormous amount of mana to move a golem. So, if the Bakius empire had an inexhaustible supply of mana, that would undoubtedly change the war situation. Mana Seed S were the best sort of supply the Baki's Empire could have asked for. The Baki's Empire must have learned that the effects of the Mana Seed S were superior to any mana restorative they had used before. So Mr. Gataruga had a bow. Spirit Mage Gataruga had a bow. Gataruga himself told me that it was so that he could fight even if he ran out of mana and could no longer manifest spirits. In addition, if he had high enough affinity with spirits, then he could instruct them even while using a bow. Then, he could use the power of spirits and make his arrows deal more damage. That was why spirit mages were taught how to use bows. As for Sophie's archery, she was steadily improving under former's tutelage. There's a reason for everything. What? What, out of the blue? I suddenly asserted something, and Cecile, sitting next to me, couldn't understand and asked a question. Helmio's party also always had breakfast with us, so all eyes were on me. No, well, it's this way. I just thought it kind of made sense. Cecile wondered if my analytical disease had returned with that statement. Alan, you are amazing at thinking and analyzing everything. Helmio's complimented me. 
he didn't know what I was thinking, but he seemed to have learned over the past month that I like to analyze and involve my friends in my experiments. Well, there's a lot I don't know after all. Heh. Is there something you don't understand, Master Allen? Tell me. Hum. For example, what attribute does the spirit god Rosen have? What? That, Master Allen. When I asked about spirit god Rosen, Fermar, who had asked me to tell him what I didn't know, fumbled and tried to avoid answering. You know right, Fermar? After all, you lived together for decades. Since Fermar was serving Sophie, a royalty, he probably lived in the temple. The spirit god Rosen or spirit king Rosen at that time should have lived for decades under that temple as well. That's. Fermar didn't seem to understand. I looked at Sophie. I am sorry. Such prying eyes. By the way, what kind of spirit are you, spirit god Rosen? I can't even guess what your attribute is. Hey! Master Allen. Fermar exclaimed at how I asked something that Sophie and Fermar weren't allowed to even in their dreams. Fugu. I am a wood spirit. The spirit of the world tree to be exact, I guess. Ha ha. The spirit god who was chewing the Baki's empire's famous Hakuman answered my question. I see. So you could use skills that increase others' status. To me, it was common knowledge that wood spirits could cast buffs. Don't pry too much after well, you're right. Ha ha. Sophie and Fermar were watching the scene, blanked out. Alan, you're really curious. Curious? Mr. Helmios. That's not true. Huh? I denied Helmios' words. Almost everyone had stopped eating because of my words. If you don't think about why, you can't make a plan. That's how the Demon King's army has been playing us for decades. How? Doberg wrinkled his brow at the mention of being played. If we can figure out why and find the answers, then we can understand what's going on. Wouldn't that change our countermeasures? I see. Doberg said just that and closed his eyes. He was convinced of something. What exactly is it that you don't understand, Alan? Cecile asked me, who seemed to know everything, if there was anything I didn't understand. As everyone looked at me, I said what had been on my mind for the past few days. Why did the gods decide to start allowing talent changes that they never had before? What? Why are you thinking that? Cecile wondered why I would question such a thing. The more I think about it, the more I don't understand. If all the talented people changed talents, then the Demon King's army would be scared to attack. Then they should have done that long ago, from the very beginning. It's hard to imagine that the Creator God and other gods didn't think about changing talents until I mentioned it. Just going from one star to two stars was an instant boost in status. If 10,000 soldiers could change talents, that alone would greatly increase the odds of victory against the Demon King's army. I even felt uncomfortable with the talent change system that was about to begin abruptly. My memory of my previous life whispered that anyone who wanted to change talents had to do some kind of strange quest to do so. I see, that's strange. Ha <laughs> ha. I looked at the spirit god who said so and continued to eat Hukuman like he didn't know anything about it. The spirit god definitely knows the answer. Or he really doesn't. Or can't he tell us? Well, for now, our priority should be to get along with Sophie's spirit. The attitude of the spirit god didn't provide a definitive answer. The contemplation continued in Alan's mind as he looked at the infant fire spirit that clung to Sophie. Chapter 252 Burning Dogora 1 My friends and I were going to the fourth floor for the first time that day. The gatekeeper of the temple, which allowed us to go to the second floor, a ten-minute walk from the base, stared at Sophie in silence. 
The gatekeeper's gaze was on Salamander, an infant fire spirit that Sophie was holding like a baby. Oh, please be quiet. Au au. He is just a baby, but the gatekeeper is still staring at him. Sometimes the salamander used to flap his hands around in Sophie's arms and get out of control. The gatekeeper gazed at the salamander quietly and without expression. The first time we tried to enter the temple with salamander, we were stopped by the gatekeeper. He was talking about what we were carrying into the temple and whether we were taking a magical beast with us. The gatekeeper who stopped us seemed to be very selective about who was allowed in and who wasn't. He is a spirit. Sophie said, standing motionless, looking at him suspiciously, but the gatekeeper still blocked our way. That's where Fermar came in. Is it correct to say that the Baki's empire does not accept spirits? He walked towards the gatekeeper and was so close that it looked like they were going to kiss each other. Fermar, Sophie, the most promising candidate for the throne of Rosenheim's escort, was a very prominent individual in Rosenheim. However, the gatekeeper was resolute and did not move, so I asked Sophie to cut off her mana supply and went in. I also asked Rosenheim to take action. On the same day, the queen notified the Baki's empire from Rosenheim through official channels. The content of the notice was a request that the Baki's empire not treat spirits with disrespect. She also added that the treatment of spirits within the Baki's empire would be discussed at the next Five Continents Alliance meeting. We went that far, so the next time Sophie passed by with Salamander a few days later, as a matter of course, the gatekeeper didn't say anything. The Baki's empire seemed to have responded immediately. Considering our value, it was inevitable. The spirit mage Gataruga said that affinity with spirits could only be improved by manifesting them for as long as possible and treating them wholeheartedly. I had told Sophie to keep the spirit manifested with her every waking moment. Is this it? It's like we are on a leaf of some kind, just like they said. Yes, it is. It's a little soft when you step on it. My friends and I moved to the fourth floor for the first time using metals. The ground on the fourth floor was green. It looked somewhat like a leaf, probably because of the vein-like streaks running through the ground. Although resilient, it seemed to be quite thick, as it showed no sign of tearing when I applied pressure on it with my foot. Is this area Helmios told me about? Eagle, go out and check the whole floor. Helmio's party was active on the fourth floor, so we already had some information about the floor. However, I summoned Erank Bird to confirm if what we had been told was true. From Erank Bird's point of view, we were indeed on a lotus-like lead floating on a water surface. We were on a lotus leaf, which had about one kilometer square area. When I looked through Erank Bird's awakening skill, Clairvoyance, I found out that the entire floor was a large water mass with many lotus leaves dotted throughout it and adventurers operating on those leaves. This entire floor is a water-based floor? The fourth floor was a vast water terrain. This is exactly what Mr. Helmios told us. Well, we're moving on griffs, so it doesn't matter to us whether we're on the water or the sand. So, will the cube also ask for what Mr. Helmios told us? I said the dungeon management system was just cube, which was contagious as my friends also started using just that. I guess so, Cecile. Let's check it out, just in case. The floor was just as we had heard. A cube-shaped object was in our view, and we decided to check the conditions for going to the next floor. Hello abandoned gamers. This is S401 Dungeon Management System. Would you like to go to the next floor? Or to the first floor? I want to go to the next floor. To go to the fifth floor, please give me five types of bronze medals, iron medals and mithril medals EA chapter. Not just five, but five different kinds of each class? It was just number of medals required while going from second floor to third and third to fourth. Does that mean we can't each go with five medals of the same kind? Yes, that's right. We cannot guide you to the fifth floor unless we receive five medals, each with a different design. 
How many types of floor bosses are there on floors 2 through 4? Each of the 5 types. I guess that means we have to defeat the S rank floor bosses. We had to defeat all the different floor bosses to get to the next floor. That would include the S rank floor bosses like BB on the second floor and Scarlet on the third floor. Helmios had told me that he had abandoned the idea of going to the fifth floor a long time ago. If he tried hard enough with his party, Helmios could defeat S rank floor bosses and make it to the fifth floor. But that included the risk of him losing his party members. So, Helmios second guessed. We now know the conditions to go to the next floor. Let's see what the fourth floor looks like. We decided to stroll through the fourth floor to determine whether to stay on the fourth floor or, or return to the third floor. I summoned Birank birds and began to move, flying in the sky. It seems that golems are very useful here too. That's amazing. Cecile, dwarves fight against the Demon King's army at sea, so of course they are useful here too. At sea, a golem piloted by a dwarf was transformed for maritime use. It appeared to be the same shape as those that could run on sand. I wonder if the dwarves pushed the battle against the Demon King's army to see to make the battle advantageous for them. In front of me was a B-rank bird in which Merle was riding alone. For a while after Merle joined us, she rode the B-rank birds with us to protect us in the rear guard by using a large shield. However, after Merle got her iron golem, she was in the vanguard with Karina and Dagora. Merle, in particular, who operates a huge golem, had a huge shield in itself for us who were in the rear guard. The difference between Karina and Dagora, who were small and flexible, brought more diversity to our tactics. Then, saying Merle's gone. Cecile started sitting behind me as if it were a matter of course. Since Keo and the two-rider team of Sophie and Fermar were the rear guard, the middle guard position with me seemed to be easier to attack. Mim, there's a magical beast over there. I shouted loudly because of the distance. An E-rank bird discovered three magical beasts that looked halfway between a newt and a dragon resting on a leaf. I thought there were a lot of aquatic magical beasts on this floor. Helmios told me that this floor had many aquatic magical beasts in line with the water terrain. And he said that the fourth floor contained mostly A-rank magical beasts. Karina, Dagora, and Merle closed the distance to the magical beast. Tam Tam descend! Merle raised HRE magic board on B-rank bird with both hands and shouted. A huge magic circle floated above the leaves, and at once a huge iron golem appeared. Then, Merle, as she was accustomed to doing, held the magic board over the crystal part on the chest of the iron golem while riding Birank Bird, and entered the golem as if she were sucked into it. The magical beasts were already aware of our presence, so all three of them rushed towards us ready for battle. One of the approaching magical beasts was held back by an iron golem piloted by Merle, who had reached 20 meters. Name, Tam Tam. Pilot, Merle. Rank, Iron. Strength, 3000 plus 1800. Mana, 3000 plus 1800. Attack, 3000 plus 4000. Endurance, 3000 plus 3800. Agility, 3000. Intelligence, 3000 plus 1800. Luck, 3000. On the third floor, we found a stone slab for giant size. When the stone slab, which was the size of two stone slabs, was inserted, the iron golem, which was 10 meters tall, became 20 meters tall and doubled all of its statuses. With Merle's skill levels and level having reached the level cap, the iron golem had gained enough endurance to keep even A-rank magical beasts at bay. In terms of attack, Karina and Dagora had the advantage because of their weapons, but it was still able to fulfill the role of a tank. Karina and Dagora hunted down the magical beast while Merle restrained it and kept it from moving. Cecile and Fermar also attacked from a distance, reducing their number by one. And there was just one left. All right, you're the last one. Dagora ran towards the magical beast with great vigor. Hey, hey, hey! 
Wait. Hold on. I heard an unusual shout from Sophie. Hum? What? Hey, duck. Dogora. Behind you. I spoke louder as I warned him. The salamander at Sophie's chest, which had been out of the battle for a long time, turned into a bright red, huge mass of flame and plunged towards the magical beasts. So, Lady Sophie own. Sophie momentarily lost her consciousness and hung down, and Fermar, who was behind her, voiced his concern and held Sophie down with both hands to keep her from falling to the ground. It seemed that the salamander had sucked all the mana out of Sophie. Hum? Over there! I struggled to control the beerank birds, but couldn't in time. Beerank birds disappeared in a glowing bubble under the salamander's attack. Dogora was burning as he jumped up like a cartoon. The last magical beast was instantly defeated by the salamander's attack, the leaves were burned so badly that the surface of the water looked large, and the water surface was boiling extensively. I am sorry, I did it again. Sophie regains consciousness and apologizes desperately for the devastation. The place was a hellscape of extensively burned leaves and steam like a boiling, seething kiln, which reduced visibility. Chapter 253 Burning Dogora 2 The fire spirit salamander defeated Dogora and the remaining magical beasts, and the salamander's fire, which turned into a huge fireball, could not be avoided, and Dogora was burned. Oh, hey! Are you okay? I'm not okay. How many times have you done this? And why me every time? Kiel jumped down from his beerank bird and used recovery magic on Dogora. Here, I have a spare pair of clothes. If they get burned too, we'll have to go back for more. The lower half of Dogora's body was in a terrible state. I pulled out a spare pair of clothes from my inventory and handed them to Dogora. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. What? No, no. But. I don't really care. His face was red, probably because he didn't want people to see his lower body. Bending over, Dogora used the clothes I had given him to desperately keep the lower half of his body in a blind spot from Sophie. The expression on his face said that he didn't want an apology, he just wanted to get away from her. Sophie, your HP is half right now. Keel, heal her. Did he take all of Sophie's, mana, and half of her HP? That's outrageous. My grimoire showed that Sophie's HP was down to half. Once I told Keel, he healed Sophie after Dogora. A-U-A-U. -A -U. The salamander, floating in the air, embraced Sophie, who had such a troubled expression on her face. He hugged her chest, staring at Sophie with dull eyes and wagging his fiery tail. Apparently, the expression on his face that said I did it suggested that he wanted to be praised for the disaster he had just caused. Oh, thank you. Mr. Salamander. In the situation where the water had boiled over and still looked like a hot spring, I struggled to squeeze out a few words of thanks. How many times has this happened? I'm afraid Dogora might not be able to hold out much longer. But still, it's a hell of a lot more powerful when it consumes Sophie's HP as well. A little further away from everyone, near the center of the leaf, Dogora took off his armor and changed his clothes. I had misjudged the salamander's power since it was just an infant spirit. Spirits use the mana of their users to influence the world. The greater the amount of mana consumed, the more power it exerts. It was similar to Cecile's extra skill in that regard. That time, it sucked up to half of Sophie's mana and HP, resulting in a disaster like that. Sophie. I've told you many times, don't be in a hurry. The spirit hears the user's voice well. They pick up on the sound of your anxiety, okay? Yes. Yes. Here it comes, spirit god's friendly advice. 
Spirit God Rosen, who was on Sophie's shoulders, participated in the battle, but didn't answer the many questions I had, but was willing to play the role of advising Sophie, who had recently become a spirit mage. Sophie had been asking the salamander to fight throughout the beginning of the battle. She was impatient with the salamander, who hugged her and did not move, and gave him too strong of an instruction. If things continue as they are now, I wonder if we should wait for Sophie's next talent change. That's good. If you're in the situation you are in now while dealing with an infant spirit, you might lose your life while dealing with a spirit. Ha <laughs> ha. That's a big deal. Is the spirit next? When a spirit is born, it is called an infant spirit, and from an infant spirit, it goes on to become a spirit, a great spirit, a spirit king, and a spirit god. Sophie could change her talent one more time, so she would be able to manifest a spirit then. However, both me and the spirit god believed that it would be dangerous if Sophie were to manifest spirit when she couldn't even handle an infant spirit properly. I had also heard from Gadaruga, a spirit mage, that communicating with spirits took time. If it was only skill experience that mattered, no matter how much the spirit went out of control, the amount of mana consumed seemed to be counted, so it was possible to change talents. However, we were talking about not pushing Sophie too hard because of what happened. Well, we borrowed the ring from Mr. Helmios, we can keep it out all day. I didn't say when it's due, so I'm planning on keeping it. Oh, thank you. Are you sure he doesn't mind? I decided to borrow Helmio's mana recovery ring for Sophie's training of the infant spirit. I also said that if Helmio's wasn't going to conquer the dungeon, he didn't need it. I gave him about 100, blessing of heaven, s, to borrow. If he had so much, he would be able to deal with any traps in the dungeon, and I told him that if he were to run low on, blessing of heaven, s, I was willing to ask Rosenheim to give him some. Thanks to the ring that looked like Minon, Sophie's mood had improved a lot, which was another story. And Cecile's bad mood was yet another story. Is Merle okay? Yes, I can fix this mood chapter. Because of the huge size of the golem, the salamander's fireball damaged the golem's body slightly. Name, Merle. Age, 14. Talent, Magic Rock General. Level, 60. Strength, 16771800. Mana, 2420 plus 1800. Attack, 782. Endurance, 1318 plus 1800. Agility, 782. Intelligence, 2420 plus 1800. Luck, 1503. Skills, Magic Rock General 6, Rocket Arm 6, Piercing Fist 6, Light Flux Sword 6, Repair 6, Alloy 2, Spearmanship 3, Shield Art 3. Extra, Combination, Right Arm. Skill Level Rocket Arm, 6 Piercing Fist, 6 Light Flux Sword, 6 Repair, 6 The last skill that Merle got, which was already maxed, was Repair. Golems could get destroyed while fighting against magical beasts. There were many A-rank magical beasts in the S-class dungeon, so the golem was constantly being damaged. There were two ways to fix the damage to the golem. The first was to replace the stone slab of the part that got damaged with a new one. For example, if the right hand of a golem were to be damaged, the damage could be repaired by removing the damaged stone slab and replacing it with a new stone slab. Of course, if a damaged stone slab were to be refitted again, the arm would remain damaged. And the other was was to use the last skill that Merle learned, repair. Repair allowed Merle to repair the damage done to the golem by consuming her mana. The downside was that the repair was not instantaneous. If we wanted to fix it right away, we had to fit a spare, undamaged stone slab. If we had time to fix it, Merle could use repair. We weren't in any emergency at the moment, so Merle was going to use repair. Oh! There's a treasure chest! Dagora, who was dressing in the distance, noticed a treasure chest placed in the center of a leaf. 
Suddenly, Kiel rushed to see it too. Kiel, there's a chance that it's a magical beast, so don't you dare open it. Kiel had a hard time not opening a treasure chest that he had seen. Since we were in a dungeon, the treasure chest might be a trap set for a magical beast. In fact, there had been many times since we entered the S-Class dungeon that an A-rank magical beast called Abyss Box was mimicking them. Dogora also seemed to have noticed my sigh and understood. He opened the treasure chest before Kiel arrived, saying that he had more endurance. Oh, it's a ring. What ring is this? Dogora came to where the rest of us were and gave me the ring. Oh, it's a high-ranking ring. This one increased intelligence by 3,000. Oh, that's a good start for day one. I have heard that the S-rank bosses are not worth the effort, but this is the best place in terms of items and experience. I confirmed with the help of my grimoire that the ring increased my intelligence by 3,000. The rings we had found before had a status increase of 1,000, but in the fourth floor, rings that increased status by 3,000 could be found. Since an individual could equip two rings at once, our status could increase at once. Then, let's see. This is for key, as planned. Oh, come on, I don't need it. When I tried to hand it to Kiel, Kiel showed both of his palms and shook his head. Because Cecile was giving me and Kiel death glares. Then Cecile. Lagging behind Kiel, I also sensed danger to my life. Hum, is that okay? Thank you. Cecile looked happy when I handed her the ring. Hum, well, it would be more efficient to give it to Cecile to increase our firepower than to give it to Kiel at this time. Now we just need to find the Aura Calcum on this floor. While Sophie had a big challenge ahead of her, Alan changed his strategy for the fourth floor. Chapter 254 Purpose Hey, it's my turn now. I was the one who asked him. Eh, I get it. Heh. Doberg silently watched the exchange between Karina and Dagora. Doberg was holding a mithril greatsword on one hand for practice. Behind our base, we had a large backyard. The servants that Helmios had brought with him washed and dried the clothes that were dirted by both the parties in the dungeon in that very backyard, but there was still plenty of empty space left. Since our party had one and a half days off after our dungeon trips, Dagora began to practice in the backyard. Karina also joined him. In fact, in my opinion, they didn't need the holiday, but Kiel and Merle wanted a holiday system like the Academy had, so we continued the holiday system. As for me, I also wanted to have enough spare time to produce, Mana Seed, S, and, Blessing of Heaven, S. When Dogora asked Doberg to practice with him, who was silently swinging his greatsword in the backyard, Doberg agreed to do so with two words. Since then, on their days off, Doberg, Karina, and Dogora had been practicing in the garden. Doberg also didn't need a day off, and Karina and Dogora took turns asking him for training, so he was in the backyard almost all day long on the holidays. When I showed my concern, Doberg told me that it was not a problem. I wondered how Doberg saw everything around him while fighting, since he had one of his eyes covered. Thank you. While watching the three of them interact, I thanked the servant who provided me tea. So, how's the fourth floor going? We've finished leveling up, so we're just focusing on our skill levels. But more importantly, I wanted to ask you something. Hum? What is it? Helmios, sitting next to me, asks me what I think about the situation on the fourth floor. About a month has passed since we entered the fourth floor, and we are steadily gathering equipment and items. But just as he was about to ask Helmios about the fourth floor, he heard a voice saying, I'm not sure. Hey, hey, Kelpie, please be quiet. Sue, 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 sue. The infant water spirit that Sophie was manifesting went wild in Sophie's chest, trying to drink the tea that the servant had served Sophie. Kelpie, an infant water spirit, was the next infant spirit Sophie began manifesting after Salamander. She had the appearance of a cute little dolphin with a two-tone white belly and light blue back. 
When I heard the word Kelpie, I imagined it to look like a horse, but in this world it seemed to look like a dolphin. Furthermore, the name Kelpie reminded me of the name of a character I named in my previous life, Kelpie, in an online game, but I never said it out loud. Translators note, it is implied that Alan played various games in his previous life. Kelpie is probably a name which he used for one of them. Every time Sophie calls out for the infant water spirit, it sends a tingle down my spine. Sophie manifested a salamander, an infant fire spirit before, but if he was not handled properly, Degoras would suffer. Because of that and also since Sophie had raised her affinity with the fire spirit to a certain degree already, I asked Sophie to switch to an infant water spirit. Note that a spirit mage could manifest only one infant spirit at a time. So what is it? I can't find any auracalcum. I'm not getting any at all. Did you lie to me? One of the main reasons why we came to the S-Class dungeon was to get the auracalcum weapons and armor, which had not yet been fulfilled. Although we had only been on the fourth floor for a month or so, we were moving faster than the other dwarves' adventurers and had already found quite a few treasure chests. However, we had not found a single gram of auracalcum. Oh, hum. I found it on the ocean floor. Ocean floor? Are there treasure chests at the bottom of the ocean as well? I had Birank fish look for anything underwater too, but the only thing I found were magical beasts. I didn't recall finding any treasure chests. Well, that's... Helmios explained to me how he found Oracalcum. He said that there were places on the fourth floor where treasures lay without being inside the treasure chests. He told me that he found Oracalcum inside a giant clam. Seriously? There are treasures that can be found outside the treasure chests? And that too underwater? That's great. How did you find it? I don't think it was a coincidence. What? I was the one who found it, okay? Isn't it amazing? Rosetta, the thief who was listening to the conversation between me and Helmios, proudly joined in on the conversation. Is it a treasure-seeking skill? Yes, it is. How did you know? Do you want to know more about it? No, thank you. I'm not going to ask for any more details, because there's no point. But still, it's a skill that's perfect for a thief. Can it tell the location of treasures within range, or something like that? I predicted the effect of the treasure-seeking skill used by Rosetta. Then while thinking about how to explore the ocean floor, I headed for the Adventurer's Guild. I left Dogora and Karina at the base since it was just for the usual deal. And as usual, I purchased a large amount of magic stones, but the price had still not changed. It was probably because there were so many adventurers and a large supply of magic stones. It was appropriate for most magic stones to appear in an empire that seek to rule the world with magic tools. In the evening, my friends and I went to dine at our usual bar. As per the rules I had set as the leader, everyone could do whatever they wanted on holidays, so sometimes there would only be some of us, but everyone was together that day. Going to the bar at night was also a way for Merle to replenish her supply of alcohol. Is Admiral Galala not here today? I see Mr. U.R. is here. I looked around as I entered the bar, but there didn't seem to be Admiral Galala headlocking his subordinate. A wolf beastman named U.R., whom we rescued from Bibi, and a cat beastman named Sarah were eating together. I looked around and my eyes met with U.R.'s. Mr. U.R., it's been a while. Are you having dinner? Oh, yes. You're here as well, today. Yes. Merle likes this place. Would you two like to dine with us? I said so and invited U.R. to dinner as a matter of course. U.R. apologized to me for bringing Prince Sue out of the blue a short while ago. Then we sometimes met in the city and had dinners together. I always actively tried to talk to U.R. whenever I saw him on the streets. My objective was to find out the movement of the Beast Kingdom. 
Yuar was just an adventurer, so he didn't seem to know the big story of the Beast Kingdom, but he seemed to know a lot about Prince the Beast. So, the only reason I approached Yuar was to find out what was going on in the Beast Kingdom or to know the status of Prince's dungeon raid. Then, you're still operating on the second floor? Oh, the Crown Prince Beck is trying to keep the best adventurers from being dispatched. Oh, please don't tell this story anywhere else. As my friends ordered their food, I continued my conversation with Yuar. Of course I won't. Then I guess it'll still take some time for you to conquer the dungeon. Yeah, and what about you, Alan? Are you going to stay on the fourth floor all the time? Yes, I think so. I plan to stay for six months. But still, how long do you have to stay here for? UR took me up on the offer, and the conversation continued. UR had never once turned down my advances. Perhaps Prince Su had told him to keep tabs on us. Maybe what he wanted to hear was not information about me and my party, but what Helmios and his party were up to. The conversation proceeded with mutual speculation. Yeah, six months for us, too, I guess. Then we can go back to the Beast Kingdom. Last I heard, the Beast Men were not eager to enter the dangerous S-Class dungeon. It seemed that those who had any talent in the Beast Kingdom were forced to go to the S-Class dungeon for a year by order of the Crown Prince Beck for the prosperity of the kingdom. They were loaned weapons and armor made of Hyrocane and Adamantite, and forced to attack the dungeon for a year. According to UR, half of the money they earned in the dungeon belonged to them, while the other half had to be paid to the kingdom. If they refused, they would be arrested for treason, so many beastmen were reluctant to enter the dungeon far from properly challenging it. When I talk to Mr. UR like this, he doesn't seem to hate the central continent entirely. Well, maybe it's just because he owes me his life. There was no sense of malice or hostility toward the people of the central continent from UR. In addition, I learned in the academy that beastmen, elves, and dwarves were also humans. Although technically subhuman, they were also educated at the academy that they are no different from humans. Prince Zhu, who didn't like how the beast men were forced to challenge the dungeon, was taking care of them in the city. He was trying to organize the disparate beast men and keep them out of danger as much as possible. You are seemed to be overflowing with gratitude to Prince Zhu. I was also told that Prince Zhu hadn't come to the S class dungeon for the sole purpose of helping the beast men. The purpose of Prince's being there was because he wanted to be the next Beast King. According to the Beast King of the time, if Prince Su was the first one to conquer the S-Class dungeon, he would be made the next Beast King. Normally, the throne of the Beast King should be inherited by the firstborn, but it feels like a rather cerebral country, where it is customary for the strong to become the Beast King. It seemed to be a country where the royalty would fight against each other for the throne instead of it being handed to the firstborn. Then, I guess, Prince Zhu came to the S-Class dungeon and saw the misery of the Beast Men in all its glory. Prince Zhu required excellent adventurers to conquer the S-Class dungeon, but he was having difficulty in calling them from the Beast Kingdom. Yuar lamented that the Crown Prince Beck was getting in the way. Speaking of which, why are you entering such a dangerous dungeon, Alan? You didn't get your orders from the king, did you? Of course not. I want the reward for conquering the dungeon. Seriously? Does it even exist? Helmios had told me that Digragni had told him about it before, so I was sure. Helmios said he had conversations with Digragni even when he was at the academy. When I asked him how he did it, he said he asked the priest who took care of the Digragni in the temple of the S-class dungeon to let him meet with him. Helmios was told that he would get the same rewards for conquering the S-Class dungeon as one would get for conquering any other A-Class or lower dungeons. My goal was to conquer the S-Class dungeon and get the reward. The S-Class dungeon was a place where one could get chunks of orichalcum and other items without having to fight against the strongest magical beast. Rewards better than that were basically guaranteed if one could conquer it. Are you serious? I have heard that even Admiral Dolores party hasn't made it to the fifth floor yet. Yeah, well. Because there is no dungeon I can't conquer. 
Yes, with conviction, Alan put into words his will to conquer the S-Class dungeon. Chapter 255 Crimson 1 My friends and I arrived at the fourth floor of the dungeon. Are we going to look for the ore calcum today? Yes, we are going to look for the shells. I summoned Birank birds and we got on them. I always summoned Birank birds on the place where we got transferred to buy the cube, so other adventurers no longer got surprised. They probably thought that one of us had a mysterious skill. I wanted to find some orichalcum to make a weapon for Karina and Dagora. Acquiring orichalcum weapons would allow us to have more efficient strategies for floor bosses and defeating magical beasts. I had decided to return to defeating floor bosses and treasure chests again only after finding some more calcum. Jembu, best of luck. If you find a shell, destroy it, but make sure there are no or calcum in it before doing so. I summoned 50 birank fishes while on birank birds back and in the water. I had all 50 birank fish destroy shells that were several meters tall at the bottom of the ocean to see if there was anything inside. I had learned a few things from my adventures in the dungeon. One was that the dungeon was alive. The leaf that Sophie's salamander had burned previously was completely fixed the very next day. Then, to my surprise, you are told me that the whole dungeon was getting a little bigger each day. The first floor of the dungeon was apparently slowly growing larger and larger every day, and the city was growing with it. It was also the reason why the streets and buildings were built in a circle around the temple. So, even the destroyed shells would be fixed by the next day. There are a lot of shells. Right, are we going to check them all? No, today we're going to look for shells where Helmio said that they found an orichalcum. Due to the clear water, we could see all the way to the bottom of the ocean, which appeared to be 100 meters deep. We started destroying shells after finding out that they had a chance of containing treasure, but they didn't seem to be the only place with treasure. But that does not seem to be the only place where treasures lie. At the ocean floor, I could see holes that looked like crab habitats or even a sunken ship-like object. I was sure that there was a magical beast sleeping inside them. Although I was interested in them, I decided to trust my information source and only look for orichalcum in the shell for the moment. Then half a day passed by. Jembu had destroyed hundreds of shells, but never found orichalcum. They ignored the underwater magical beasts and continued to search extensively for the shells. It's not easy. I guess I'll have to ask Rosetta. There's no way we will find orichalcum in a day or so. We'll have to change our methods a bit. I decided to ask for Rosetta's help after all. Hum. Cecile didn't answer. Cecile didn't seem to like the idea of asking Rosetta for help. She didn't know what Rosetta would say to me in return for her help. Hum? What's wrong? There's a big shell. I saw a big shell from one of the birank fish I was using, sharing on. The birank fish tried to destroy the large shell but couldn't do so. A birank fish could defeat a birank magical beast, but it couldn't destroy the shell. The shell was clearly different from the other ones. Oh! Is this the one? Gather around, everyone. Concluding that the large shell that a birank fish couldn't destroy was the one that contained a treasure, I called every birank fish at that location. My friends and I also moved towards that large shell. Here? We arrived above the surface of the water with no leaves nearby. Hum. Ellie, go to the bottom of the ocean and pull it up. Yes. We had reached the sky above the shell, but the birank fish had yet to destroy the shell. The shell was very sturdy, so we decided to pull it up and retrieve the whole giant shell. Several birank spirits dived to the bottom of the ocean. It was then. M.M. It's an enemy. It's coming this way at great speed. Hum? What's with this crimson body? An earank bird, which had been scouting the fourth floor, spotted a huge flock heading underwater towards the large shell. Enemy. 
I raised my voice to warn my friends about the upcoming danger. Cecile clutched her staff behind my back. The S-rank floor boss. The Crimson is coming. I knew that we were not facing a single magical beast as our enemy. E-rank bird saw a crimson dragon, called Crimson Kaiser Sea Serpent. And surrounding it were blue dragons, a different color and one size smaller than the crimson dragons, called the Kaiser Sea Serpent. The S-rank floor boss of the fourth floor, commonly known as Crimson, was flowed by ten A-rank high-tier magical beasts. The B-rank spirits and B-rank fish, who were trying to pull the large shell up, were surrounded. Every single one of them turned into a glowing bubble. Underwater seemed to be Crimson's domain. The enemy is in the water. Let's reduce their numbers. Cecile, you attack with ice magic. Yes. Deciding that fire wouldn't be effective enough, I asked Cecile to use ice magic. We prioritize defeating the various blue dragons surrounding Crimson than defeating Crimson itself. Well, Helmios told me to run the moment we see Crimson, but I wonder how strong it is. Helmios had told me that he had never defeated Crimson. So we had to find a way to do so ourselves. Karina and Dagora also attacked the blue dragons, which had emerged from the water to eat us, who were above the water. My friends had already gotten strong enough after multiple talent changes to be able to handle F high tier A rank magical beasts. Slowly, the number of blue dragons started to decrease one by one. Gaius! Crimson cried loudly from under the water. Its cry, loud enough to be heard even above the water and to vibrate the surface of the water, was transmitted over a wide area like a shockwave. Oh! Could this be? What Helmios was talking about. And soon, out of nowhere, came blue dragons in numbers equal to the number that we had defeated. This guy called for help. We're back to square one, aren't we? Oh, look out! Cecile exclaimed, but Crimson and the others didn't want to give her the time to do so. From underwater, they shot water cannons like rays of light. Crimson and his team began to use water magic to target us, who were in the sky. The column of water created by the water cannon reached several hundred meters into the air. They began to shoot the water cannons without regard to where we were. It was no longer safe to approach the surface of the water. We should retreat for now and come to pick it up once they are gone. Defeating Crimson was not our goal. Instead of bothering to continue the never-ending battle, I was thinking about retreating. Then, once Crimson would retreat with his force, we could retrieve the large shell. Ah! Lady Sapphirone! Sophie screamed as she was hit by a water cannon that reached the rear guard's position, which was quite high up in the air. After confirming that Fermar was safe, Kiel quickly used recovery magic. Are you okay? Yes, thank you. Oh no. The attack reaches the rear guard. The only option we have here is to run away. I decided to retreat. While I was thinking about retreating, Kelpie, an infant water spirit, rubbed her face anxiously against Sophie's body. It's okay, Sophie said, patting Kelpie and trying to reassure her. As if to shake off Sophie's hand, Kelpie moved her head, glared at Crimson, and let out a loud cry. See you, see you, see you. Kelpie, don't. Lady Sapphirone. I could only say so mu chapter. Sophie lost all mana from her body. It seemed that even her HP had been sucked out of her. Kelpie, the infant water spirit, went out of control in a way that everyone could understand. Oh, come on, you've got to be kidding me. What is this? How the hell did you do this? Hey, we're all getting caught up. Retreat! The water level began to rise extensively. I shouted for Dogora to get away from the water, as he was the closest to the surface of the water. I couldn't believe what happened next. Gaius asked. Crimson and the others shouted, but that didn't matter. 
The water where the crimson and his force was located was lifted entirely from the ocean floor. As if a transparent jelly had been hollowed out only at the center, eleven dragons rose into the air, still contained within the giant ball of water. Hey, hey, I can see the bare bottom of more than one hundred meters of water. I didn't know what forces were at work, but even when the water was lifted, the surrounding water didn't intrude upon the empty space. There was a huge hole cupped in the surface of the water. Ha ha. I guess even Alan can be surprised. What? Infant spirits have this kind of power? Spirit God rose and seemed happy to see that I was surprised. The power of an infant spirit? Kelpie is undoubtedly a descendant of water god Aqua, you know? Of course she is strong even now. Also this place is especially helpful for water magic. It is quite surprising that Keely was able to do this much by only consuming all of Sophie's man and half of her health. Ha <laughs> ha. Spirit god Rosen boasted Kelpie, the infant water spirit's power. I see, so the terrain effect made this so much stronger. The dragon sealed inside the giant water bubble tried to escape from it. A kind of crack develops on the surface of the bubble. I didn't have time to analyze what it was properly. Ellie, pull it up, quick. Yes. I summoned three Birang spirits and had them salvage the large shell from the bottom of the ocean where there was no water. My friends and I, along with the three Birang spirit with the shell, hurriedly left the place. Not long after we left, a tremendous earth-shaking sound came from behind us. It was the sound of the water bubble bursting and the captured dragons fell. My friends and I ran away without even looking back. Thus, Alan and his friends succeeded in obtaining one large shell. Chapter 256 Master Craftsman Habrak My friends and I took the large shell a great distance from where we found it, so that Crimson couldn't follow us. I can't see inside. Let's open it and take a look. Keel moved his face close to look into the mouth of the shell, but he couldn't see the inside of the perfectly closed mouth of the shell. Oh, I'll take care of it. And goo. Dogora put strength into both hands and tried to pry open the mouth of the shell. Dogora forcefully and slowly opened the mouth of the giant shell, which the Birank fish couldn't destroy. Oh! My friends and I let out a sound of surprise at once. The sparkle that everyone had hoped for slowly became visible through the shell. It contained a slightly craggy, pale, gold-tinged lump of orichalcum. I pondered what I could make from the lump of orichalcum. Let's see, weapons for Karina and Dagora, and then a shield for Dagora. This lump can only make one of those. Karina and Dagora used very large weapons. The lump of orichalcum, considering the size of it, was only enough for one of their weapons. And their armor and shield would require more orichalcum than that. I had been looking for the orichalcum for some time then, but after finding out, more than the happiness at finding it, I was trying to figure out how to use it. Well, let's make this one a greatsword for Karina. Oh, for me? Yes. Orichalcum weapon. Karina raised the lump of orichalcum to the sky with both hands, her whole body exploding with joy. My friends sometimes required the same equipment. In such cases, I was the one who decided who would get the equipment, based on efficiency. Everyone had agreed upon it since the time we were in Academy. So even though Dogora did not get the orichalcum, he didn't say anything. And no one complained when they saw Karina expressing joy with her whole body. Then, three days passed. We did our best to find another lump of orichalcum, destroying all the shells, but we could not find it. It was a little earlier than usual, but we decided to leave the dungeon. What? Are you looking for orichalcum? I already found it. Yes. Karina was holding the lump of orichalcum with both hands, and my gaze was drawn to the pale gold glow. My friends and I spent three and a half days in the dungeon and took one and a half days off, while Helmio's party spent three days in the dungeon and took two days off. 
We left early to meet up with Helmio's party. Mr. Helmio's. I want a great sword. Um, yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay, I'll show you tomorrow morning. Helmios was slightly taken back by Karina's pressure who was holding the orichalcum in both hands. He said that he would take us to the blacksmith who could process orichalcum into weapons the Zet morning. Riding on Birank birds, we left the tower of the S-class dungeon after a long time. Master Habarak stays quite far from here. It will probably take us about two days to get there at this speed. Helmios told us as we were flying through the sky. Helmios had traveled to Fortania on Birank Bird and Rosenheim, so he knew how fast Birank birds were. The imperial capital of the Bakius Empire was only half a day away from where we were, but the blacksmith's place was about two days away. My friends and I and Helmios were all going to the place where Master Craftsman Habrak stayed to ask him to make Karina the Orichalcum Greatsword. I was told that Master Habaral was a stiff person and was someone who easily got into a bad mood. Then, two days passed. We were still riding Birank birds. The landscape has changed around here. I noticed that the terrain had changed. The terrain was becoming more mountainous and rugged. And there were many volcanoes, with plumes of smoke rising from craters everywhere. Oh, this area is already in the old kingdom of Mercia. I heard it used to be called the Land of Fire. I see, it was a different country before it was absorbed into the Bakis Empire. Even in the academy, I had read that the Bakis Empire had united the continent into one country after the Demon King's army's first invasion. We had traveled a long way and it seemed that we were already out of the former Bakius Kingdom territory to the territory of the former Melika Kingdom. At this rate, we can reach there today. Then, after some time, a city entered my sight. That's the city where Master Habarak is. Yes. Shall we get off a little ahead? One of the only three legendary master craftsmen isn't staying in that big of a city. Helmios had told me that there were only three blacksmiths in the world who could process orichalcum. The city where one such legendary master craftsman lived was a normal-sized town or barely a city with a number of chimneys visible but no other unusual features. Although Helmios didn't know the way exactly, we were able to arrive safely, thanks in part to Erank Bird's eagle eye. Originally, Helmios wanted to use magic boats while transferring from one port to another for travel. I decided to get off a little further away and head into the city so as not to startle the citizens with Birank birds. We entered the city at a time when it would soon be evening. The guards let us in without any issues when we showed them our adventurer's card. There were no humans or beastmen there, only dwarves. I wondered if the city was not very profitable for adventurers. Not only weapons and armor, but also earthenware, ceramics, and various other items were displayed in stores, as if the town was full of blacksmiths. Oh, Master Habarak's workshop is here. Oh! Helmios pointed to one building, and Karina's heart pounded to a climax. Karina had been holding the lump of orichalcum to her chest the whole time. The building was a modest structure that did not look like any other building. I saw a chimney in the back, so I expected a furnace or something for smelting ore to be in the building. Knock knock. Helmios knocked on the door. He was going to introduce me to Habarak, a master craftsman, so I decided to step back and let him handle it. Yes, who is it? The knock was answered and the door opened slightly. Then, as if peering outside, a young dwarf man peeked out and asked. My name is Helmios. I have something to do with Master Habarak. It is already late today. I would like to come back tomorrow, if that is all right. Helmios? Are you Hero Helmios? Yes. I'm here to ask Master Habarak to process orichalcum. Sounds a lot like the way I responded to a newspaper solicitor when he came to my door. Helmios was frank with the young dwarf who had the door open only wide enough to show half of his face. Sorry, please take it back. Huh? 
Helmios told him who he was and what he wanted but the young dwarf still told us to go back. My friends and I listening in the back were surprised, not expecting a quick rejection. What? Can I speak to Master Habrak? Last time he said, you can come back any time to me. No, actually, he is in a very bad mood right now. I apologize. Apparently, Master Craftsman Habarak was in a bad mood. But Helmios couldn't leave with just that. It's very important. Could you at least do me a favor? I understand. I don't think his answer will be any different though. With that, the door closed. The young dwarf headed for Master Habarak. Looks like we're in the right place. Uh-huh. Karina replied in a small voice to my words. Karina's expression was shunned and depressed in shock at the rejection. Soon after, the door opened slightly and the young dwarf peeked out. How was it? No good. Please. I brought the orichalcum. Could you please make it into a sword? Karina, who had been watching from all the way back, stepped forward. She really wanted an orichalcum greatsword. No. Please. Karina pressed further on the young dwarf who refused. Karina, you're going a little overboard. Don't trouble him further. Yeah. Sorry. After I admonished Karina, she apologized to the young dwarf. Hey, what's that noise coming from a while ago? I am sorry, Master Habarak. I am refusing them. Someone came noisily from the back with an old man's voice. Before the young dwarf man could say all that, the door opened all at once. Then an old dwarf man with a cloth-like thing wrapped around his head appeared. Huh? What's up with you guys? Oh, Master Habarak, it's been a long time. Hum? Isn't it Helmios? This old man is a legendary master craftsman. Yes, I am here today to ask you to process the orichalcum. Helmios told him what we were there for. Then the young dwarf blocked his face. Orichalcum. Yes. Karina showed the orichalcum she was holding. Then, veins emerged on Master Craftsman Habarak's face. I could see from the side that he was furious. You guys, where did you find that? In the dungeon. I noticed that something was wrong with the angry Master Craftsman Habarak, so I stepped forward to reply on Karina's behalf. A dungeon? Are you adventurers, then? Yes. As soon as I replied, Master Craftsman Habarak grabbed me by both arms. Habarak was a master craftsman, smaller in stature than me, but he easily lifted me with his veiny, blacksmith-trained hands. Master Habarak! What are you doing? What did those children do to you? Helmios was also puzzled, but tried to admonish the master craftsman Habarak for his behavior. You people are worshipping that little digragni. Master Freya is so angry that she can no longer strike Orichalcum. What does that mean? I restrained my friends, who were worried about me, with my hand, and asked them the reason for what was happening while I was being held. Oh, because of you guys. God, damn it. When I said so, Master Craftsman Habarak released. Then he collapsed to his knees and put his hands and head on the ground as if he was crying. Ah, uh, sir? I am sorry, Master Freya. I'm sorry. I tried to talk to him, but I couldn't reach Master Craftsman Habarak. Habarak, a master craftsman, was at his feet, his face scrunched up, apologizing in a trembling little voice over and over. Alan and the others were not sure what was going on when they saw the master craftsman Habarak apologizing to Freya, the fire god, as he punched the ground with his fist and sobbed. Chapter 257 A Selfish World Habarak, one of only three master craftsmen in the world who could process orichalcum, looked exhausted. Habarak, master craftsman who was lost in despair and sobbing in front of us, apologized to Freya, the fire god. 
my friends and I were helpless, too stunned to do anything about it and unable to say anything to him. Several dwarves, who appeared to be his apprentices, came out of the building that served as a workshop and house, and carried master craftsman Habrak back. We were told that Habrak was tired that day and that he would like us to come back the next day, so we decided to stay overnight at a suitable inn and come back another day. Then, the next day, we all headed to the building where master craftsman Habrak was. This way, please. The same dwarf who hadn't even opened the door properly the day before let us in. We were shown to a guest room and said that he would call master craftsman Habrak. We all decided to wait in silence. After a short wait, Master Craftsman Habarak, dressed in the same craftsman-like attire as the day before, arrived. This was the oracalcum you guys found, right? Without mentioning the matter that he broke down crying yesterday, Master Craftsman Habarak talked about the pale, shiny golden glow that was placed in front of him. His expression looked somewhat lonely. Yeah. On the table was the lump of oracalcum we had found in the dungeon. Karina replied in a somewhat more subdued manner than usual. I see. I'm sorry, but as I said yesterday, I can't process oracalcum anymore. Karina's eyes glazed over, but she said nothing more. Master craftsman Habrak removed his gaze from the lump of oracalcum and silence prevailed in the room. This sword that Master Habarak made for me has helped me tremendously. An oracalcum sword forged by a master craftsman, huh? I got hurt by that sword myself. Helmios talked about his own oracalcum sword. Helmios had an oracalcum sword and armor. His sword was made by Master Craftsman Habarak. And according to Helmios, his armor was a national treasure of Jayamut Empire. It was apparently on rent. Thank you. What did you mean when you said that you can't process oracalcum anymore? Helmios decided to ask what Master Craftsman Habarak meant exactly. No one among us thought that Master Craftsman Habarak had gone senile and refused to process oracalcum. There had to be a reason. My friends and I listened in silence to the conversation between Helmios and Master Craftsman Habarak. Master Craftsman Habarak closed his eyes and mouth. The fire is getting weaker. And I can't hear her anymore. With that, Master Craftsman Habarak began to speak. According to him, his furnace's fire suddenly became weak a while ago. And he said he could no longer hear fire goddess Freya's voice, who used to whisper to him when he was blacksmithing. Translator's note, it is only clarified here that God of Fire is a female. So, I am using goddess from here on. He sounds more like a priest than a blacksmith. I wonder if legends in their field get close to God. I was candid about Habarak, the master craftsman who processed oracalcum while conversing with the fire goddess. And Digragni caused this? Yes. After the Bakius Kingdom became the Bakius Empire, I don't know if he has become a dungeon master or whatever, but he's been making a lot of money, and I've been giving him a good run for his money. Apparently, it wasn't what Fire Goddess Freya said, but Master Craftsman Habarak's prediction. This is what you are said too. Admiral Galera doesn't think well of the Bakius Emperor either. I recalled what you are had told me about the situation in the Bakius Empire. The Bakius Empire made its citizens believe and pray to Digragni and made money from wars against the demon king. According to UR, Digragni was making the imperial citizens pray to him through his subordinates for how much he had contributed to the Bakius Empire. The emperor of the Bakius Empire even hoped that the war against the demon king would continue for a long time. If the war continued, the demand for magical tools would increase in each country, and they could be sold to other countries at higher prices. And the S-Class dungeon also attracted adventurers from all over the world, and both the activities of the adventurers and the treasures they obtained in the dungeon benefited the Bakius Empire. So that's why they are providing minimal aid to the Central Continent. And their information matched the current situation of the Bakius Empire that I knew. 
The Bacchus Empire only provided the minimum necessary aid to the central continent in the form of magical tools and golem users. Naturally, they had never sent an army to the forgotten continent, home of the Demon King, that was in the northern part of the central continent. If the aim of the Bacchus Empire was to make money, then there was no reason for them to go out and attack the Demon King's army, even with a military force that had fought them all off at sea. Even I can understand how difficult it would be for the world to unite, abandoning all interests. Still, it's not good if we don't. I had lived 35 years of life experience in my previous life, so I didn't believe that the world was made up of just fantasies and ideals. I believed that it was difficult for the world to unite as one, as I wondered how many countries had completely disregarded their national interests. However, their current situation was very bad against the Demon King's army. The Bacchus Empire, which was driven by making money and postponing war. The Jayamut Empire was using the Five Continents Alliance to its advantage through hegemony. Rosenheim was exclusive and hated interference from other countries. Albahar Beast Kingdom had its vision blinded by hatred. And Ladash Kingdom, which was in the midst of a factional struggle for the succession to the throne. This makes the Five Continents Alliance nothing more than a name. Because the war wasn't a short war, but a long one that lasted for decades? Maybe, but no, that's not the quintessence. I couldn't help but wonder if it was even a ploy by the Demon King. So that's why the fire goddess, Freya, has stopped lending her power? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. How many people, even those who used to be in the kingdom of Mercia, have now forgotten their faith in Freya, the fire goddess? I see. That's all I have to say. You can go back now. I can't even process adamantite properly with this kind of fire. Every one of us became silent, including me. Master craftsman Habrak said that he couldn't process orichalcum because of belief in God. So what were we going to do about it? I didn't have an answer at that moment. While my friend's eyes were focused on me, wondering if we were going to leave, only the small animal on Sophie's shoulder was looking at Master Craftsman Habarak. Ha ha. Not at all. No, it can't be. Yes, it is. That's right. I can't keep quiet about this. Ha ha ha. What? Master Craftsman Habarak glared at the spirit god Rosen with a strong gaze for a moment because somebody denied his words. But he stopped glaring after a moment. I wondered if he had sensed the presence of a god. The Freya I know would never abandon the dwarves. I know she is fierce, but she has always cared for them. She has always loved them more than any other race. What? There is another reason why Goddess Freya stopped helping. While Master Craftsman Habarak was astonished, I understood the true meaning of the spirit god's words. Yes, there is, Alan. There is another reason. There's a reason why she stopped helping the dwarves. Ha ha. I just can't figure it out. Either way, Orichalcum couldn't be processed. I'll go to the Divine Realm and ask her. She might just tell me. Ha ha. The spirit god on Sophie's shoulder floated in the air and disappeared. He seemed to have traveled to the divine realm. Master craftsman Habrak was upset and left looking at the place where the spirit god was. I had heard stories from Helmios about what the spirit god was. I see, you are with a god, I see. I'm sorry about yesterday. Yes, this was a dwarf's problem, but I blamed it on you. No, it's all right. Master Habrak once again apologized to me for grabbing me by the chest the day before. That's how desperate he must have been to see anything at all. Then an hour passed. My friends and I decided to sit tight and wait because of the situation. I lost track of how many cups of tea I had. After another hour or so, the spirit god appeared. How was it? I'm not sure. Ha ha. His expression lacked any energy at all. 
He was in his flying squirrel form but I could understand the look on his face that showed despair. Spirit God? Sophie looked at the spirit God with great concern. Sophie your own. Yes. Before I tell you what I'm going to do, I promise you one thing. Yes. Spirit God. Looking straight at the spirit God, Sophie replied that she would accept any words. As a spirit God, I am above all for the elves. Based on the pact I once made with the prayer priestess, I promise to use all of this existence for the elves. So I hope you don't worry. Yeah, why? Sophie wanted to say why he said that, but couldn't. It was a question of how prepared one must be to say such a thing, even though he or she had become a god. Everyone was looking at spirit god Rosen with bated breath. The situation seems to be more serious than I thought. If this continues, the world will be destroyed in less than a few years. Ha ha. Spirit God Rosen uttered that the world would be destroyed in a few years. The spirit god's laughter sounded much drier than usual to Alan. Chapter 258 Divine Artifact The spirit god Rosen went to the divine realm to see why master craftsman Haberach could no longer hear the voice of fire goddess Freya. But when the spirit god returned from the divine realm, he said that the world would be destroyed in a few years. What do you mean the world will be destroyed? Yeah. This is not what happened just now. The prelude to destruction of the world happened when you were protecting Rosenheim. The spirit god started to give us an orderly explanation of what happened. During the war in Rosenheim? Yes. While you were fighting the Demon King's army on the ground, the main army of the Demon King's army seems to have invaded the Divine Realm. The main army? You're telling me that the main force of the army wasn't present in the war? Don't be the worst-case scenario. That's right. It is just as you predict, Alan. Hey, Alan, talk to us so we can understand. Since this was a conversation that only Spirit God and I could understand, Cecile asked me to elaborate. No, we talked about it during the war, but didn't the Demon King's army look strange compared to what we heard at the academy? I guess the right way to describe them was that they were just a bunch of magical beasts in a clique. I remember Master Alan talking about that. For Mar also recalled a conversation I had with him when we were fighting the war in Rosenheim. I had said that throughout the war, the Demon King's army was acting strangely. The army was a numbers-driven, advance-only force with few supply units. It was a bunch of magical beasts with no solid chain of command and only a heavy emphasis on offense. They were just hungry magical beasts. I had learned at the academy that the Demon King's army was cunning and would attack their enemies' weak spots. That, too, was the reason why the Central Continent was losing war after war after war. It was different from what I had learned and felt uncomfortable, and I talked to my friends about it several times during breaks. So, they really were a disposable unit like you said? Keel also recalled. I guess they were just distractions. They wanted to turn the gods' attention to this world in order to make it easier for the main army to attack the Divine Realm. So you're saying that 10 million magical beasts were used as disposables? The principal of the academy had told me that the number of magical beasts was very high. My friends and I were able to win the war, but it was not easy because of the sheer number of the magical beasts. But if all of that was a diversion or something to achieve a goal, it all made sense. Just how strong is the Demon King's army's main force? One hypothesis circulated in my mind. The main army was an army made up of evil dragons, ancient dragons, demon generals and great demon generals. That sounds strong. The army we fought against used the term disposable. Ancient dragons are said to be as strong as demigods than S-rank magical beasts after all. Each dragon was probably an army equal to or greater than that of the Demon General Razels or the floor bosses of the S-Class dungeons. I think that means that every member of the main army was at least an S-rank. 
So what happened to the Divine Realm? The Demon King's army never expected to be able to destroy the Divine Realm where the gods stayed just because of their strength. They had a clear goal in mind when they invaded the Divine Realm. Goddess Freya? Yes. They attacked Freya's temple. It seems that the Demon King's army had their sights completely set on Freya. So, what happened to Goddess Freya? Master Craftsman Habarak was concerned for Goddess Freya's well-being. Freya is one of the four great gods. There was a bit of trouble, but with the help of other gods, she was able to successfully repel the Demon King's army. Both sides suffered some casualties, but the Demon King's army was still repelled. I see. Master Craftsman Habarak was relieved by the spirit god's words. But something important was taken from the temple. The Demon King's army was able to steal the divine artifact that made Freya the fire goddess that was in the temple. The spirit god spoke about divine artifact. He is willing to tell us so much detail about the divine realm while he was hell-bent on not saying anything before. The situation was so serious that spirit god Rosen was willing to tell us about divine realm. Is that why the fire got weaker? This time of the story coincided with the time when Master Craftsman stopped hearing Goddess Freya's voice while blacksmithing. Master Craftsman Habarak could no longer hear Goddess Freya's voice and the fire was too weak to process orichalcum. Even adamantite couldn't be processed properly. Yes. If a god is deprived of his, her divine artifact, he or she ceases to be a god. Oh, no. Tears came to the eyes of Master Craftsman Habarak. And you think that will result in the destruction of the world? That leads us to where we are now. If Freya continues to use her power as the fire goddess as she had been prior to losing her divine artifact, she will turn to stone in about three years. Stone? Maybe that's God's way of dying. Everyone was waiting for the spirit god to continue. We were waiting to hear what would happen to the world after three years. In less than three years, the power of fire, which now affects adamantite, will soon no longer be able to process mithril. We will be fighting the demon king's army with ragged iron armor and scrap iron weapons. Oh, no. Then what will happen to the mithril mines in the White Dragon Mountains? Cecile, of the Granville family, and Kiel of the Carnell family were worried about the mithril mines in the White Dragon Mountains. The power of the fire goddess will be lost from this world. I learned that the weapons and armor needed in the war against the Demon King's army would soon be unavailable. And the number of weapons and armor available in the dungeon doesn't provide enough weapons and armor for the troops. Weapons and armor were expendable. It would be difficult to obtain new ones and difficult to repair them. We would be forced to fight against Birank or higher magical beasts with inexpensive weapons and armor. So the gods have decided to allow talent changes to try to balance the situation? That's right. The gods have decided to spread the story to the world about the fall of the fire goddess via oracles to the Pope and Ch chapter. The gods had decided to give bad news and good news to the people to alleviate some panic. Is this why the talent change is allowed? I had been questioning why the gods had decided to allow talent changes at that moment when they had done nothing about it in the past. But their reason was simple. The world was about to be destroyed. People were about to be faced with despair. It was also a terrible despair. The Demon King did not not rule over anyone. Soon the Demon King's army would use magical beasts to slaughter people in the most horrific ways. I can't protect all places at once. But still, why did the Demon King's army target Goddess Freya? Even if I could defeat millions of magical beasts, I wouldn't have the power to protect everyone in the world. No matter how many, blessing of heaven, as I distributed, if the soldiers, equipped only with inferior weapons and armor, couldn't withstand a single blow of the magical beast and die instantly, they would have no time to use them. But that was not what I was thinking about. I understand the situation. 
but goddess Freya is one of the four great gods and I have heard that she is a more ferocious goddess than Aqua and Gaia. Would the demon king's army go out of their way to target such a god? I had learned at the academy that even God had ranks. This knowledge of theology was one of the best things about attending the academy. Elmia, the creator god, was an absolute god. And then there were gods who were not as powerful as the creator god, but immensely powerful in their own right. I had learned that the fire goddess Freya, god of earth Gaia, god of wind Nilil, and water goddess Aqua were especially powerful. The four great gods with their overwhelming power were exceptional compared to the other gods, but Freya, the fire goddess, was also well known as a raging god. While the god of earth and water goddess specialized in protection and healing, the fire goddess specialized especially in attack. People even said that if goddess Freya were ever angry, the volcanoes would erupt and burn the earth. If I were the one invading, I would target a weak god, so was goddess Freya a weak god? Does that have something to do with the fact that we dwarves have stopped praying to goddess Freya and started praying to Digragni? Master craftsman Haberak uttered what was on my mind. Is it true, spirit god? You seem to be very close to the truth of the world, Alan. But I can't say anything more to you. There is still something he can't say to me in this situation? The spirit god closed his eyes and refused to answer. It seemed there were some things he couldn't say, even if the world were to be destroyed. Enough is enough. I am sure that Freya was losing her power little by little. That's why she was targeted by the Demon King's army. Oh, no. We dwarves are turning Goddess Freya to stone. The dwarves stopped praying to Goddess Freya, which made her weaker. Master Craftsman Habrak held his face in his hands when he learned what was happening to Goddess Freya. What? How long has the Demon King been planning this for? I understand, Cecile. This has been in the planning for decades. The Demon King's army has been waiting for the dwindling number of dwarves praying to Goddess Freya and the loss of her power. The war against the Demon King's army had been going on for more than sixty years. That would explain why the Demon King's army didn't completely attack. And what are they going to do now with the Divine Artifact? The disparate Five Continents Alliance and even the greedy Emperor of the Bacchus Empire seemed to be a strategy of the Demon King's army. And we had to consider what the next move of the Demon King's army, who had acquired a divine artifact would be. It seems that the Demon King's army is definitely planning to attack and destroy the world. Ha <laughs> ha. The last words of the spirit god seemed to be somewhat reminiscent of his own words to himself. It even sounded to me as if the Demon King's army was planning an invasion not only on this world, but also in the Divine Realm. Alan knew that he had only a few years left to live and that the future was doomed, so he pondered what he should do. Chapter 259 Vessel of Faith My friends and I were at the usual bar, which served Merle's favorite drink. It seems that making armor out of the exoskeleton of the magical beast is still possible. I see. Sophie was relieved. Beside her, Fermar nodded emphatically. Not long ago, we had heard from the spirit god Rosen that the fire goddess Freya had been robbed of her divine artifact. With the loss of the divine artifact, the power of Freya, the fire goddess, gradually lost its reach in the world. And after a few years, the power would be so low that we would only be able to process iron into weapons. The Demon King's army wouldn't have to fight. Within a matter of years, the entire continent would be massacred by magical beasts. I asked how far and to whom I was allowed to tell the information that the fire goddess was robbed of her divine artifact. The spirit god only told me that if I did not blow the whistle, he would leave it to me. For the spirit god Rosen, the most important thing was the peace of the elves. He felt very strongly about that. I learned and thought of something during the war in Rosenheim. I found out that the exoskeleton of more than a million B-rank or higher insect-type magical beasts was light and strong and could be used for armor. Bones and tendons from the dragons could be used for bows, and fangs could be used for arrowheads. 
I told the Queen of Rosenheim that I wanted the materials from the huge amount of magical beasts we had defeated to be processed. Even though the reconstruction of Rosenheim had not yet been completed, she readily agreed to give priority to the project. I also asked Viscount Granville to investigate and find armored ants' nests. I was glad that I hadn't annihilated the armored ants. This armored ant armor could also be processed into sturdy armor. An investigation was underway to determine how many nests contained armored ant queens, which were prolific and could produce large numbers of armored ants in a short period of time. The emperor of the Jayamut Empire on the central continent via Helmios was informed and asked to develop a national countermeasure. With the world's largest population of several hundred million, the Jayamut Empire could make big moves. Helmios had sent a servant of his with a letter to the emperor of the Jayamut Empire. I was sure that those efforts would extend the lives of many people around the world. However, it was impossible to predict how many years their lives would extend by. It's just a life-prolonging measure. We need to come up with a solution. What we needed was not a life-prolonging measure, but a radical solution to the problem. The solution to the problem, in my opinion, was to get the divine artifact back from the hands of the Demon King's army. I had thus far found solutions to my problems based on my memories of my previous life and games. However, what I learned from the recent incident with the divine artifact being stolen was that the Demon King's army had been meticulously planning and acting for decades. The invasion of the Demon King's army, which had 10 million troops, was only one of their strategies. I was late to start with so if I didn't do anything then I would always be one step behind. If I were to ignore the Demon King and focus solely on leveling up, as I did in the games I used to play, the world would be destroyed. But we couldn't fight against the Demon King's army without leveling up and equipping ourselves. Can we afford to stand here without doing anything? Keel asked me anxiously. For Keel, no, it's not. Everyone has a family, including me. No wonder he is anxious. Keel was the head of his family. He had not been calm since we heard the story of the fire goddess's divine artifact being stolen. He must have been thinking of his sister and servants in the carnal territory when he heard that the world might be destroyed in less than a few years. Yes, there is much to be done. But nothing will happen with us being impatient. We need to rest when we need to rest. That said, there is still a lot that has to be done, so help me. Oh. Do you have a plan? Of course you do. My plan was to do several things in parallel from then on. But that didn't change what we had to do at that moment. By Moo Chapter, we still had to conquer the S-Class Dungeon. The reason we had originally come to the S-Class Dungeon was to change talents and equip ourselves with the best equipment available. And also to receive the reward for conquering the dungeon. It made sense to go through the dungeon in order to break through the situation as we were still struggling against demon generals. Alan, you're amazing. Hearing the conversation between me and Kiel, Helmios praised me. We were having a meal at Helmios' party during that time. For what? For putting together the party. Now, more importantly, have you negotiated with Digragni about the special reward for being the first to conquer the dungeon? Oh, of course. He readily agreed to give us a special reward for conquering the dungeon. By the way, what do you have in mind for the reward, Alan? No, no, it's for the world. Besides, we don't always get our rewards. Yes. It's still good. There was a temple in the center of the first floor of the S-Class dungeon. And the dwarven priests who served Digragni took care of him. It was similar to how the elves served and took care of spirit god Rosen. No ordinary adventurer was allowed to meet Digragni, but Hero Helmios was not an ordinary adventurer. But even without being a hero, if one made a formal request to the temple, he she could visit Digragni. I then asked Digragni a favor. The favor was to get a special reward if my party were the first one to conquer the dungeon. 
Based on my memories of my previous life, I got the idea that we deserved something special for conquering the dungeon for the first time. I had heard from you are, the beast man, before that the S-class dungeon had never been conquered before, so I wanted something special as a reward for being the first one. I then asked Helmios to ask Digragmi to let me choose what he would give us as a reward. Helmios told me that Digragmi readily agreed to do so. It was a light-hearted reply, without any change in emption apparently. Digragmi had no sense of dignity as a dungeon master. So, does Digragmi also have a divine artifact? Yes, he has one. He was very happy when he got one from Master Elmia. He was glad that he worked so hard as a dungeon master. The spirit god's brow wrinkled at those words. It was an unpleasant story for him, it seemed. Alan, what's the use of asking that? Hum? Cecile. If you don't know what a divine artifact is, there's no way to find it. I see. Don't act like I know what you are talking about. Cecile complained. For example, can Helmios become a god? He is a hero beloved by the entire empire, after all. What? Hero and god? What are you talking about, Cecile said. How about you, Helmios? If the people in the empire continue to deify you, do you think you can become a god in any way? No, it doesn't feel that way. Alan, what's wrong? I think, and I've said this before, that a divine artifact is a vessel for gathering faith. I had told the same story before in the workshop of Master Craftsman Haberach. Vessel of faith? Yes, it is. I think that's the closest I can come to describing it. I had been thinking about faith in God. It was a long time ago, but I still remembered when Sophie, when we were still at the academy, talked about how faith begets God. The creator God Elmia probably distributed vessels of faith called divine artifacts to those who are qualified to become gods. Each of those who were handed out desperately gathered faith. Rosen, Digragni, and Freya all gathered faith. Those who had gathered faith for a certain period of time or a certain amount of faith would become demigod or god. Even after becoming a god, they would have to work hard in their own way to keep the followers and gather faith. I believed that the gods of the world couldn't remain as gods if they didn't do anything. Even if someone is hailed as a hero, or is thanked and praised as if they were a god, those who, like Helmios, had not received a divine artifact from the creator god Elmia, could never become gods. I see. Helmios looked at the spirit god with conviction. Spirit god Rosen remained without blinking. He looked like a statue as what I had said might have been an absolute taboo that we were never supposed to know. However, a kind of cold sweat was running like a waterfall from his whole body. But now it looks like Digragni has nothing to do with the demon king's army. Well, from the beginning I knew there was nothing. The dwarves' increasing faith in Digragni resulted in weakening of fire goddess Freya, which ultimately led to her divine artifact being stolen. For a moment, I thought that Digragni might have been under the control of the demon king and had gathered the faith of the dwarves to weaken the fire goddess Freya, but I came to the conclusion that it was not the case. To begin with, every god had to gather faith to keep being a god. The demon king's army, in my opinion, just took advantage of that rule. If the demon king's army just wanted a divine artifact, then every god out there had one. Digragni also had one. According to the spirit god, the divine artifact of fire goddess Freya, one of the four great gods, was very valuable. It was so powerful that it sustained the power of fire of a whole world. I get that, but so what? Cecile didn't believe that the fire goddess's divine artifact was something that could be stolen just because the demon king's army knew about it. Everyone looked at me, wondering why I was talking about it. Yeah, I'm not sure yet, but with the current hypothesis, it's about time one possibility came along. What? What's coming? Cecile had no idea what I was talking about. I always talked about thinking, but that day, Cecile thought that I was thinking more than ever. 
I was fully utilizing my previous life experience to solve the problem. It's almost time, but he is late. I looked at the clock mounted on the wall. I was supposed to meet you are, the beast man, at the bar that day. Bang! As I was looking at the clock, the door opened with a strong bang. I looked toward the door and saw an enraged lion beast man standing there. Am I really popular that Prince Su comes to meet me every time? I wondered if I was popular and if it was a trend for Prince Su to open the door with all his vigor every time he passed through a door. Well, the rats are really here. Move along, all of you. Ha! Huh. The beast men, who appeared to be under his command, grabbed their weapons and rushed into the store all at once. Chapter 260 Evil God Beast Prince Su, with his men in tow, walked into the bar looking furious. Did you are fail? But why is he so angry? I had asked you are, the beast man, to do some research after. However, I didn't understand why Prince Su was so outraged by the content. Prince Su slowly approached the table that my friends and I were occupying. Oh, Prince Su, would you like to join us? Helmios was also surrounded by the beast men, but he didn't raise an eyebrow and called out to Prince Su. Helmios. Is this some kind of ploy by the Jayamut Empire? What? What is? Helmios had no idea what Prince Su was talking about. Helmios looked at me, thinking that I knew something. Oh, that's probably me. I then looked at you are, the wolf beast man, who looked apologetic behind Prince Su. Alan, is it? You're the one snooping around the beast kingdom. You've got a lot of nerve for a rat. Prince Su was impressed as I said so while drinking fruit juice and a nonchalant look on my face. It's disturbing to hear you say snooping around. It was the allies who were looking into it, and if you put it that way, the Beast Kingdom had something to do with it as well. Okay, that's pretty relevant. The Confederacy was a group of small and medium-sized states on the continent south of Rosenheim that was politically and economically united. I had intended to check with you are, but it is just as well that Prince the Beast is here. Please, there is a seat available. I said that there was a seat available at the table I was sitting in and invited him. What did you say? The expression on Prince's face became even more grim as I asked him to take a seat. Keel, the most jumpy of my friends, looked worried. He seemed to be swallowing the words, Hey, is everything okay? Huh? Are lions frightened of rats in the beast kingdom? Things won't go anywhere until you take the seat. Oh, oh, this is funny. Very funny. Oh, right, I'm thirsty from all the walking. I, too, shall have a drink or something. Prince Su was so angry that he was having a hard time slurring his words. With an awkward smile made to show that he could afford it, the Prince Su slowly took a seat. Helmios admonished me with a glance that said I was going a little overboard. One of the beast men under Prince Su's command who had surrounded us went to the counter and ordered a drink. So why were you snooping around the beast kingdom? As I said earlier, it was the allies who were looking into it. I see. But didn't you also say that the beast kingdom was involved? What were you looking into? Prince Su probably took the seat because he remembered that he had not thanked me yet. I tried to be a little more polite in my language. He seemed to have calmed down after drinking the ale. Hum? Just to be sure, am I correct in understanding that this is an exchange of information? What? What the hell, you? The gratitude for saving the beast man, which had been so hard to nip in the bud, was discarded as Prince Su reached the peak of his anger once more at my words. I had heard from Yuar that Prince Su was very good to the beast men, but he seemed to have quite a temper. Of course. It is an exchange of my information between Prince Su and me. This is a transaction. If you think you can't trust my words, here is the Princess of Rosenheim and Hero of the Central Continent Helmios. M.M.? 
but ngh. Prince Zut didn't seem to trust me. He slowly looked at Sophie and Helmion. Then he looks at Sophie and Helmios. Sophie had a higher position than Prince Zhu as Sophie was the future queen of Rosenheim whereas Prince Zhu was not the crown prince. His party or group of beast men were also weaker than Helmio's party. Alan, that's enough provocation. Prince Zhu, it's useful information. I don't know what he wants to know, but I can assure you that the information he will provide you will be valuable. Helmios intervened and politely spoke to Prince Zhu. Valuable, is it? Of course. We can be the first one to talk, and if the information is not valuable, then we do not need any information from Prince Zhu. How about that? Helmios further persuaded Prince Zhu. Hum. I get it. If the hero of the Central Continent says so much after, you guys can drink whatever you like. Hey! Prince Su was aware of the important exchange of information, so he dispersed the beast man who had surrounded the table. So, Alan. Please, you first. Yes, Helmios. As expected of a hero. He managed to persuade Prince Su while keeping his face in perspective. I was impressed and carefully explained to Prince Su everything from the discovery of the Orichalcum to the story of how the fire goddess Freya was robbed of her divine artifact. I also talked about what was going to happen in the future. The spirit god was busy eating so he didn't say anything the entire time. Prince Su frowned several times, but listened carefully nonetheless. I see. It's a rather outlandish story, but is it true? Can I trust you? The Central Continent and the Beast Kingdom were virtually enemies. On the surface, they were militarily united because of the Five Continent Alliance, but that was only on the surface. It was unknown when the Beast Kingdom would start their invasion of the Central Continent. The information I had just shared with him showed a possibility where the Jayamut Empire, which was directly at war with the Demon King's army, might suffer a disastrous defeat as a result of the theft of the divine artifact. No, no, a talent changing system is set to be introduced. Talent change? I also told him how it would be possible to change one's talent in the future. It was still under work, but a system was being coordinated, which was set to begin the next year. If true, that is indeed valuable information. Do you think that they are related to the Beast Kingdom? I nodded strongly as I understood what he was talking about. Both the fact that Fire Goddess Divine Artifact was stolen and a system that allowed for talent involved in the Beast Kingdom. No, as I said before, it is the Allies. I'm talking about the Beast Kingdom's involvement in the Allies' defeat of the evil cultists. Well, sure. Hum. That's why you were looking into Shay? I had heard a number of stories from UR about the Beast Kingdom over the past few months. During that time, I had also asked for more information about the right of succession to the Beast Kingdom's throne. I had to know who would be the next Beast King. I wanted to stop the Crown Prince Beck from ascending to the throne. In the Beast Kingdom, the firstborn was basically the Beast King. But it was not uncommon for the best children to come from sources other than the first child. The first child could be ordinary, or the second and subsequent children might be born with superior talents. In such cases, the second and subsequent children were given a big test, and those who overcame the test could succeed as the Beast King even if they were not the first child. Prince's test was to be the first one to conquer the unconquered S-class dungeon. This S-class dungeon, called the Tower of Trials, was an ordeal that Prince Su must overcome. But Prince Su was not the only one who received the test. The youngest sibling of Prince Su was his sister also known as the Warrior Princess. Even the princess, who excelled in character and in battle, was put through a severe ordeal. It was to subjugate the evil cult. A pagan religion was born in one of the allied countries and spread to other allied countries. It was born decades ago and was gradually gaining followers. It was said that if people believed in them, they would not be invaded by the demon king's army, or something like that. 
In fact, the Demon King's army never invaded the Confederacy. Because of that, the number of followers grew slowly but steadily. And a few years ago, the teachings crossed the ocean and entered the Beast Kingdom. Since there is trade between the Allied Nations and the Beast Kingdom, even the teachings of the pagan religion were transmitted along with the trade. And the teachings of the pagan religion were slowly spreading throughout the Beast Kingdom. The Beast King was furious at the situation. The Albahar Beast Kingdom believed in the Beast God Garm. He was worshipped as the Absolute and Only God. Therefore, he ordered his youngest child, the warrior princess, to subjugate the evil cult. I was told that the allies were also cooperative with the Beast Kingdom. Yes, I am wondering if the Demon King's army will give the divine artifact to the evil god. The Demon King's army was always planning and moving ahead. I thought about it for days to find out what use the divine artifact could have. For me, who had memories of my previous life, an evil cult was as much a target to defeat as the Demon King. Even though I didn't know the teachings of the pagan religion in my previous life, I had been exposed to many cults. I also had the prejudice that the pagans would do things that were definitely not good. I came up with the idea that the divine artifact would be given to the evil cult leader who was being pursued by the warrior princess, and that he would gather faith and start doing something nefarious. I see, but I don't see that happening. In response to Alan's questioning of the suspiciousness of the pagan religion having the divine artifacts, Prince Su assured me that it was unlikely. What? What do you mean? M.M.? How can you be so sure? Just the other day I got a letter from Shay. It said that she had captured the head of the pagan cult and handed him over to the headquarters of the Elmiacha chapter, he will be brought before a religious tribunal shortly. What? Oh, I see. What? He got caught? Will he also face a proper trial? So that means the next beast king will be the youngest Princess Shay. One of the allied countries was the Elmali Church State, the general headquarters of the Elmia religion. Prince Su also told me that Princess Shay was able to subjugate the evil cult easily, thanks to the full cooperation of the Elmarcha chapter. Then again, I guess I completely missed the guess on this one. When I heard Essel cult I wondered if it was for those who believe in the creator god Elmia or the beast god Garm? I am so embarrassed by my smug prediction. They might have been declared as a pagan religion because other religions were not tolerant. A trial will be held, but the result will most certainly be their execution. It seemed that Prince Su even had an ear for the fact that the evil cult had done some pretty bad things. We then talked about some dungeons and the future. Divine artifacts were to be used in some form or another in the world. We finally shared the understanding that if we heard anything that sounded like a divine artifact, we would have to look into it, and we disbanded for the day. Then Prince Su got up from his seat and uttered a few words. Next time you want to know about Shay, come and ask me directly. Is that clear? Yes, I will. What is it? Just a brother who loves his sister. Alan thought that Prince Su was apparently acting out of concern for his sister.